Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, we have a draw on here. please. In accordance with Section 5 of the Open Public Meetings Act, Chapter 231, Public Law 1975, be advised that a notice of this meeting was made by posting on the Bolton Board, Town Hall, and mailing to the officially designated newspapers. A list of the meeting dates annually indicating this meeting would take place uh, at the Town Hall at 7 p.m. on Monday, February 6, 2023. Ashley <laughs> Abigail? Here. Amy Lauren? Here. Paul Craig Here. Gary Rosen? Here. Virginia Truitt? Here. Vice Chair Logistic Lab? Here. Jerry Craig Here. We start this meeting um, with approval of minutes of January twenty third, uh, twenty twenty three. Uh, who's eligible? Ashley, Amy, Gary, Regina, and Jessica. Any corrections or changes? Otherwise, can I have a motion to adopt those minutes? Move approval. And a second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Um, next up, we have three memorializations for this evening. First up is calendar 3800 21, High Center, 4037 439 Milburn Avenue, 7 Bible Terrace in Milburn. Who's eligible now? Amy, Wolfgang, Ashley, Jessica, Craig. If there are not any the changes or corrections to that memorialization, can I have a motion to adopt? Motion to adopt calendar number 3800-21. And a second? Second. Amy Lawrence? Yes. Wolfgang Yes. Ashley Abigail? Yes. 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 Next up, we have calendar 3902-22, C. Skay and J. Luskowitz. Seven Ivy Terrace in Milburn. Hey, uh, Ashley, Amy, Wolfgang, Gary, Jessica, Craig. Unless there's any changes or corrections, could I have a motion on that memorialization? Um, I'll move approval calendar 3902-22. Great, second. Second. Ashley Abigdor? Yes. Amy Lawrence? Yes. Wolfgang Tutorial? Yes. 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 And lastly, we have calendar 390022, Ann Comaros and P. Manis at 670 Ridgewood Road in Milburn. Unless there's any changes or corrections, can I have a motion? Eligible are Amy, Ashley, Gary, Wolfgang, Jessica Craig. We'll move adoption of the memorialization for calendar number 3900 22. Thank you, Wolfgang. A second. Second. Take a pick. Amy Morris? Yes. Ashley Abigdor? Yes. Gary Rosen? Yes. Yes. Jessica Yes. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Okay, on the new business side of things tonight, we have calendar 373519, um, Abraham's Cappadia, 15 Park Road in Short Hills. Applicants are requesting one year extension um, for that. So this, so this is so this is a resolution that was adopted uh, on or about March second of twenty twenty. So this is a request that is being made uh, three years almost um, after the resolution was adopted. Uh, my understanding is that the applicant who received this approval uh, has since moved, and their purchaser wishes to. Your architect is actually here. Right. right. To, to effectuate um, the resolution with an extension. You want to want to come forward? Need to go? Oh, the homeowner. Would like to speak? Yes. Hi. Yeah. Um, come up to the microphone, please. Yes. And, and just before we even uh, get started with any uh, statements, uh, because this is a request that does not constitute a, a full-blown change or significant revision of the application or the approval, they don't need to provide any type of notice to, to surround property owners. So. Correct. 
Um, so the uh, Abrams had requested <coughs> and uh, received permits for the okay, extension. First, yeah. first, first of all, let's, why don't you state your name? Oh, sorry. I'm Mansip Kapadia, one of the owners okay, of the Can you spell Park. your name, please? M A N S I, last name K A P A D I A. And your address? 15 Park Road. And you're the new owner, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, so they had requested and received the permits for an extension um, in the backyard uh, for which they needed a side yard variance. We are sticking to the same um, boundary of, of what they had requested. And so we are requesting an extension um, for the approval that they had received. So, so for how long have you owned the property? Since June 2021. And is there a reason why you waited until now to make the request? Well, it was, you know, last year was insane with the supply chain. We didn't want to start something and have it go um, awry on us. And you're willing to comply with the various conditions that were contained in the resolution, including uh, recording of the deed restriction? Yes. Yes, maybe. Yes. Um, my name is, yes, um, my name is Ying Li, spelled Y-I-N-G-L-I. I'm an architect retained by the Kapadia. And uh, uh, basically, when we started to design this, okay, they moved two years ago during pandemic. So, um, you know, that's basically a reason that uh, they didn't start right away. And then um, it takes time to get to know the house. And so when we started to do, do the design, um, basically for me, this is a parameter. Uh, the, the variance the previous owner seeked, sought and got approval for is um, basically existing non-conforming conditions. So any any um, addition will trigger that, uh, that variance is inevitable. <coughs> but for us to design, basically I stick to whatever was proved. So for us, that's a parameter we're going to work with. So any design, we are not going to trigger any variance other than the exact exact uh, extent of 26.5 feet backwards. So there's no other variance being sought. So okay. we'll, yeah. So, so the, what was granted in March of 2020 was a 11.04 foot side yard setback. Yeah. Yes. So you're gonna you're gonna honor that. Yes. Setback. Yes. And um, the the applicants one of the conditions is that the construction would be in accordance with not only the testimony of the witnesses but also the plans prepared by Dubinet Architects LLC. So are you now the architect of record? Yes, correct. Because um, I think the new owner, um, right now my clients, they seek different design and uh, with different <coughs> interior flow. Um, but um, exterior wise, we are working with the boundary that was approved. Yes. So, so here's, here's yeah. the issue. The issue is that the approval was granted in part based on the representations and the plans from, from Dan Dubinet. And if they're changing the architect, the approval would be based on different plans. Are your aesthetics remaining the same or no? Um, Exterior wise? There will be difference. We'll have more windows. But I think anything anything that is different from the previous design, they are not uh, pertain, pertaining to zoning. Um, as far as zoning is concerned, the, on, the only- well, You're asking for a variance, zoning is concerned. Uh, Yes, I think uh, the item, the, the zoning concern, the item that pertaining to zoning is the side yard setback. There's more to it than that. Uh, aesthetics, um, uh, they are not exactly the so, same. I mean, if your fenestration is changing. Correct, fenestration that does, that, that does impact okay. potential, you know, other potential issues. That's fair. So, it doesn't now trigger any uh, item, but yes, the, aesthetic, the, it, the aesthetics are different. The fenestration has changed. Legally, the recommendation would be for the applicant to come back, even if we call an amended application, just to prevent, present revised plans from a new architect showing the revised elevations, because obviously one of the criteria is the negative criteria, 
and show that there's no detriment to the neighborhood. And I think just like in any app application, the board would want to take a look at the exterior elevations and see how it fits with the uh, with the neighborhood and surrounding property. Hey, Andrew, sound great. When we see this. So are you ready? I mean, do you have revised plans ready yes, to go? Yes, we're ready. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I have to be here on March 6th, so I'll just leave it at that, which will be, so I already have three on March 6th, so probably, and then we have three. Well, March 6th, I mean, yeah, let's yeah. just do the next one then. Okay. Not gonna be. March 20th. March 20th, work? Can you yes, have everything to, yeah. to our zoning department by then <laughs> and so forth? Yes. So this will be an amended. It'll be an amendment. amendment. So, so we're not going to start from the beginning. We're basically going to take this resolution and you're going to say one of the conditions is that uh, Dubin at Architect LLC's plans were relied on to grant the variance and now we have different plans and you're going to walk through the different plans and the board's going to take that into consideration. Okay, uh, will the home homeowners need to do the notification and uh, publish notice? I don't, I mean, it, it's really up to the board I and mean, I don't know how you feel. I think yes. I mean, especially if you're changing the Windows, everything else. I mean, the neighbors. It's not better. Yeah, and, and the, the other issue. It might be. And the other issue is that well, if it's better. Yeah. All well, better. <laughs> right. And uh, the other issue is that if this was granted in March of 2020. There may be change in the neighborhood, like you know, different owners of, of property. You want to That's fair. Give them an opportunity to take a look at. It. Okay. If you stay the same exact way, different story. Okay. Sure. Now we'll start with applications for this evening. Um, judging by the number of people in here, um, and we have two um, the period for questioning and then period for comments. Okay. And um, we're starting our first uh, matters, which was carried from January 9th. No. I'm sorry, no, that's got moved. No, yeah. Okay. Got it. So, first up, calendar 390922, 156 Main Street. Perfect that space. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Anthony Sursillo. I'm with the law offices of Levitt and Sursillo in Milburn. On behalf of Trifecta Event Space, uh, they seek to occupy approximately 2,300 square feet at 156 Main Street and to utilize the parking lot at 175 Main Street. Building at 156 Main Street has been vacant for decades and last occupied by a commercial user called, I believe, Milburn Train and Hobby Store. When I started practicing law in Milburn, that store was open. Um, both properties, the subject site where the building is situated and the parking lot property are in the R8 zoning district. The applicant seeks your approval to establish a event space venue with the kitchen. This use requires a use variance in the R8 zoning district. The property contains no on-site parking spaces. The proposed commercial use requires 27 parking spaces, which is an increase of 15 parking spaces from the prior commercial user, the train and hobby store. The applicant has reached a parking lot agreement for 16 spaces with Dr. Crosser, the owner of 175 Main Street in Milburn. The applicant also requires variances for the proposed size of its sign and for a new awning. We also require preliminary and final site plan approval and a couple of waivers from the environmental impact statement 
and storm water runoff provisions. We've received and reviewed the five township professional reports. I filed my proof of service and Mr. Chairman, uh, I've got four witnesses. If there are no questions, I'd like to call my first witness. Very well. Thank Here's you. Up. Mr. Richard Keller. Good evening. Good evening. Do you swear from testimony about the gift might be the truth, whole truth, the truth? Yes, I do. do you need Richard Keller, K E L L E R. Mr. Keller, can you give the board the benefit of your professional credentials in civil engineering and professional planning? Yes, certainly. I'm a licensed professional engineer in the state of New Jersey, licensed since 1989, and licensed as a planner since 1990. I hold a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from Rutgers University with a concentration in water resources and environmental engineering. I also hold a master's degree um, in architecture from the New Jersey Institute of Technology um, with a concentration in urban planning and design. It's also a, a an institute that I taught uh, both graduate and undergraduate levels for approximately 11 years. I have appeared before this board, approximately 110 boards throughout the state of New Jersey as both a licensed engineer and planner. I've also provided engineering planning, uh, engineering services to the township of Long Hill uh, Planning Board and Board of Adjustment for three years. And I've also been provided planning uh, consulting work to the borough of Caldwell. Um, my licenses are in good effect and I'm taking 14 hours of education in two weeks. So. Uh, they'll continue to be in good effect. It's both nice to be back. Thank you. Your qualifications are acceptable. Mr. Thank Chairman, you. I'd like to just at this time have Mr. Keller testify as to the civil engineering aspect of his testimony and then save the planning as the last of our witnesses. Very well. Thank you. Mr. Keller, what have you investigated, reviewed, and studied for purposes of your testimony this evening? Certainly. Um, well, having been on Main Street since 1978, um, I am familiar with the site. I bought my son's first train um, set at this location and some a fair amount of Yu-Gi-Oh cards too, I think, um, at the same location. Um, I've, uh, I, we, our, my firm has surveyed this um, from the 70s through the 80s. Uh, and done survey work for the current owners and now for this, uh, this applicant. I've reviewed the master plan I reviewed the zoning ordinance. I'm familiar with the flood maps of the township of Milburn, the adopted flood study, and the, uh, and the FEMA maps for the area. And uh, I have uh, met with the owner both on site uh, and in preparation to go over their business model a number of times. Can you please describe the site and the surrounding neighborhood? Certainly. Um, I'm going to start with the, the cover sheet. Um, that's exactly as you have put part of your set. Uh, it's the, uh, the cover sheet from our site plan. Um, the site is a 51 foot by 127 foot property. It's rectangular. It's located on the east side of Main Street, approximately 100 feet south from Ridgewood Road. And it's about 160 feet south from um, the southeast corner of uh, southwest corner of Taylor Park. The property is, um, I would point out that the property um, contains. 6,729 square feet, so it's between a sixth and a seventh of an acre, 0.15 acres. Um, and it is located wholly within the R8 residential district. You can see that the R8 district is a lot of the properties along Main Street that front um, on Main Street with the properties to the west uh, behind being in the R7 zone and the properties to the east um, that back into those being in the R, uh, R6 zone. You can see the blue shaded area is part of the South Mountain District. It's across the river, and I'll get to that in a second. And that is the R6 zone. Um, basically, the R8 zone uh, does reach back and capture the uh, the apartments at Lakeside. Uh, and it goes all the way up to the shop right where the shop right turns into the B3 zone. Um, my office is a commercial office on the next block. That's located in the CMO. But this block is um, characterized by having a, a good infill of very old single family houses, some old apartment buildings, and a number of both older and newer commercial pro projects that, uh, that line Mil uh, Main Street from coming over the bridge uh, over 78 up until you hit the, uh, the B4 Central Business District about 660 feet further to the north. The, uh, 
I go quickly to the survey, which is the sheet two, um, and you'll notice our survey and site plan aren't much different because there's not a whole lot that we're doing to the site. You'll see that um, the back third of the property is actually the west branch of the Railway River. So our property actually goes across to the wall on the other side. Um, so the, about the back third is actually water. The, the building is indicated about 2,305 square foot footprint is biased to the front. It is uh, immediately next to uh, a medical office building. And to our right is uh, uh, a nail salon and a dry cleaner. And it looks like, I think we got them reversed there. I'm not sure. Um, at any rate, the um, and there's a driveway, 12.9 feet, um, 12.8 to 12.9 foot driveway that comes back into some uh, dilapidated pavement at the back of the site before you hit the wall and drop into the river. On the north side, there is a door and egress with a, with a landing pad. Uh, there is a little bit of a chimney further back that's actually um, covered under dirt right now. That's the existing site as it exists today. Um, yep. So you said there was maybe a mistake in terms of identifying the uh, the uses to the right next to the driveway. Can you just clarify that? No, I have I have it correct. It is the nail salon immediately uh, immediately adjacent to the driveway, and the dry cleaner is on the parking lot. So that is right. Um, I'd like to go through my first exhibit, which would be A1. And this is a uh, six photographs labeled photo, photo board number one. All photographs were taken by myself, Casey and Keller, uh, on uh, this past Saturday, February 5th of 2023. They have not been altered in any way, and they do represent the site as it exists today. Can we maybe just... Uh oriented a little bit just so that the friends of the public to the extent they can see and yep. will follow the testimony facts. Right. I did a I did a quick um polling for and I didn't think there was anybody in opposition but I but it is a little easier to see and if anybody wants to see it's probably easier to go over this yeah. side. So out of the five photographs starting um the property in question uh again this has been uh vacant for at least at least 15 years that I know of, I think closer to 20 years it's been vacant. Um, immediately adjacent to the property is uh, a medical office building uh, that has been occupied and un unoccupied. It was Dr. McGlone's office before he moved up uh, to the R8 across from my office. Uh, it's, it's had various medical uses over time. I think it's somewhat unoccupied right now. Um, you can see that uh, to the right is the driveway that goes back approximately 62 to 65 feet right now, uh, and turns the corner into the back into the back near the river. Looking at the building straight on, uh, this was the old sign panel that contained the uh, Milburn train station uh, information. You can see the driveway. Um, the architect will go over the removal of the windows and the changing of the facades, et cetera, how that's being uh, um, beautified and made more attractive with current um, state-of-the-art glazing and doors, et cetera. Um, photograph number three, we're looking slightly to the uh, to the southeast. You can see the Beyond Nails and the dry cleaners, and there's the driveway, which we're gonna to continue to activate. That driveway was always used by the, the previous applicant for both deliveries, as well as for parking a few vehicles. And essentially, we've labeled it uh, on our proposed plan as being a, um, a loading space, but uh, loading will be limited, and we'll talk about that um, when the applicant describes their business. But uh, it, in addition to being a loading area, we're not, uh, unloading in preparation or before an event um, for bringing in some catered food. Uh, they will have uh, this for loading and there will be the ability to park uh, the owners, uh, park one or two cars in that area as it exists. Photograph number four is looking back at the river, looking up at the bridge over Ridgewood Road. You can see that there are some large alianthus trees in the back, which we'll talk about in both the reports and the, and the, the um, forester's report and the engineer's report. Uh, you can see the building is in poor, it's quite a bit of disrepair. The old chimney is, is uh, broken. There's a crack in the back of the built facade. It's hard to see, but you can see we're essentially right on the river, uh, and that's part of our property that spans the river. Looking straight back from the driveway, photograph number five. Uh, this is looking directly to the, uh, the properties that uh, front on Greenwood Place. Um, you can see that uh, the existing landscaping between the large deciduous trees and the evergreen plantings completely obscure the house that is located at uh, 135 Greenwood Drive right behind us. So um, there is no existing buffer on our side of the property. There is buffering on the neighbor's property. 
and I'll talk about why DEP regulations say we can't actually install a buffer in that area in a few minutes. And then finally, photograph number six is looking uh, south along the river. You can see there is some parking behind the nail salon right next to us, uh, and you can see the relative uh, state of disrepair. These trees have been requested to be removed by the forester, and we're certainly going to comply with that, and I'll talk about that when we get to the professional reports. The, um, the other one I want to show as a, an exhibit would be A2. And A2 is an annotated aerial photo. The photograph is taken from an imaging site near map.com. The image was taken uh, mid morning on March 11, 2022, and basically uh, still um, looks fairly much the same. I have superimposed the site as well as the street names on it, and I've added some shading to show the, uh, the floodplain as it affects this area. It's a little confusing um, in our downtown when you compare both FEMA maps and the adopted flood study um, that uh, the DEP uses uh, that the town did back in the in the early 70s. This represents the uh, the DEP um, delineation of the flood zone. The flood zone um, coming through Taylor Park um, around the Bower Center between the tennis courts, coming uh, behind the basketball court, running basically the first house uh, on Ridgewood, and then. Um, it, uh, it misses that one at 135 and then sort of spreads out. The entire area from this all the way to another block to further to the west or the bottom are all located in what's known as a special flood hazard area. So as we know, this is the area that floods in Ida, Floyd, Irene, a little bit Sandy. Um, what, is, uh, what is notable is that the property is actually located in a subset of that flood zone known as the flood wet. Floodway is basically the, the primary conveyance of the water in a flood uh, situation, and that is much more severely restrictive than the floodplain. So DEP restricts your abilities to build um, in, in a floodplain, and then when you talk about the floodway, uh, there are additional restrictions put on top of that. Uh, we are located, the entire site is actually located in the floodway, and if you've been um, down, you know basically that once the water can't get over Essex Street, it comes down Main Street. Some of the water also comes out of the pond and it floats over and Main Street becomes part of the river as it comes down. And actually it doesn't turn here, the actual functions, it doesn't turn until it gets just past the shop right and, and goes down uh, uh, East Willow. But this is the area that conveys 95% of the water during a flood event, according to DEP studies. And this is similar to the FEMA map. Um, the, as I said, development is highly regulated and limited in a floodway. And the primary DEP restrictions as it relates to a floodway is you can create no new multifamily housing. So any of the apartments that exist um, across the street up into uh, uh, certainly uh, the apartment building that sits to our further east, um, those would not be able to be um, constructed today. In fact, actually, any of the apartments along Main Street, none of them could be constructed under current DEP regulations. So no new multifamily housing is permitted. There's no creation of additional commercial or residential habitable space on the first floor. So we can't expand the footprint of this building um, unless we dedicate it as being not habitable. But what would it be then? Um, no fill can be placed on the property. We can't fill anything. I can't plant um, heavy buffers within the shadow of the buildings behind me because they become... Um, possible flood uh, elements that would clog the stream. So we're not allowed to plant back there. Um, there are some restrictions on removing riparian uh, vegetation, but um, they do allow for removal of those alianthus trees. Um, and there's also a, a, a section of the DEP regulations that's also mirrored in our town stormwater management ordinance, which is the substantial improvement clause. And that substantial improvement clause basically states that um, you can't invest more than 50% of the value of the structure um, into the property um, without needing a special permit. Now, that special permit can be granted if you're in the flood plain, but when you're in the flood way, there is no relief from the 50%. So you're just strictly not allowed to do that. Um, and so there's really no way that you can, you can significantly improve that. You can't put a second floor on it because that would exceed the 50%. You can't put a parking, you know, an empty parking lot, which can be in a floodplain, but to create second floor space because, again, um, it's not permitted in the floodway, only in a flood zone. So the 50%, um, it's called the 
um, substantial improvement, substantial um, um, uh, damage clause would further limit the ability to do anything. So that building that we have there is basically it, or we zone it into in utility and it comes down someday. But uh, the uh, so if we revisit the zoning, um, and I'll, I'll get a little more of this now, and I sort of preface some of my planning testimony. If we revisit the zoning within the uh, the parameters of the floodplain issues, the R8 residential zone, the purpose is to provide for multiple dwellings in areas where they're compatible with existing development and to allow variety in housing types. And the permitted uses are one, single family dwellings, two, two family dwellings. Both are permitted prohibited on the site by DEP. Again, no creation of habitable floor here on the first floor within the floodway, and we can't add the second floor without substantial improvement. Um, also permitted are attached dwellings and apartments. Multifamily is not permitted without dry access. I have to have access to a building above the floodplain. Um, basically, the floodplain, which basically stops at Palumbo's now in May, is going to go another block further. None of these areas will be um, permitted by DUP to do multifamily housing because you can't get dry access. So essentially, the four permitted uses for this zone, none of them are permitted by DUP. And that's probably why it's been, was a retail center for so long. Um, with regard to the, uh, the proposed plan, we're looking for preliminary and final uh, site plan with a use variance and C variances. Um, I'll let the architect talk about the, uh, the architecture of the cleanup of the existing facades. Um, what's relevant in terms of engineering, I guess go to my, I go to our site plan sheet three. Um, again, you'll see there's not a whole lot going on. We're removing the pavement in the back. We're striping the existing pavement. Because there's been a little bit of, um, of fill over time and I can't clear onto a neighbor's property, we're actually proposing to cut a little bit to allow for the last door to be an at grade egress door. So that's our legal second means of egress. There's another access door at the uh, the, about a third of the building forward. Uh, that is not required for, for, access, for egress. Uh, our back one is, and we're calling for that area to have a curb around approximately uh, 27, 30 feet of that. Originally, we called for proposed concrete. I didn't realize our ordinance doesn't allow that. I, mean, I forgot that. I've only been here 40 years. but um, So we're going to switch that over to granite block instead. And that's really just to mitigate the grade a little bit and make sure we can, we can have a, a handicap access um, barrier-free access to that back door, which is our second means of egress. Um, we are removing the uh, the pavement in the back. Uh, we'll talk about the engineering report and the uh, uh, forces report. We're going to remove any uh, non-native invasive trees. There is a door on the left side. Uh, that will not be a new door. It'll be a replacement or a, a fixed-up door. That's a two-and-a-half-foot door. The other doors on the right side will be brand-new three-foot doors. The um, With regard to the, uh, the salient... Um, uh, parts of the site plan is that there is no increase in building area, no increase in building coverage. There is a reduction in the pervious area uh, and no fill is being placed on the property. Again, just that small amount of curb in the back um, and the existing driveway on the right side again will function as a pre-event on loading space, uh, which can also function for two or three cars. We also do have a uh, lighting and landscape plan which is our sheet four, part of your package. And again, um, the evergreen trees that are along the left side of the building, they're shown on, actually they didn't make it onto, onto photograph one. They're just kind of peeking around the corner there. Uh, those are not on our property, so we're not replacing those or taking them down. What we've done is we've come up with, uh, we're gonna clean up the left side of the building and uh, put all basically um, ground covers and, uh, and foundation plantings that will thrive underneath that uh, evergreen canopy, uh, mix of liriope, English use, spreading use, et cetera, on, on that side, and really just to clean up, remove a pavement in the back. Uh, we did provide for two lights along the uh, along the driveway. Those lights are do provide a lighting distribution that is fully compliant with the township ordinance with regard to uh, lighting under uh, under section uh, 512. What's notable is um, not only complying with the maximum and the minimum and the, uh, the average, um, our maximum 
is 1.6 foot candles where 10 foot is permitted. So we're much, um, much less bright or overlit than would actually be permitted by our code. And with regard to uh, uniformity, um, the max to min ratio, they're allowed to be as high as 10 to one. We're down at 2.3 to one and max uniformity, uh, average to minimum uniformity, where 4.1 is um, our ordinance. And that's actually really hard to meet most times. We're down at 1.7 to one. What that means is we've devised a lighting plan that doesn't have very bright spots that go into dark spots into bright spots. Um, besides sticking out in the neighborhood, it also makes it harder for users because their eyes can't adjust going from light to dark and it makes it less safe. So it's a very understated, simple lighting plan that will not, uh, it's actually on the, on the lowest side we can make it and it's as uniform as we can make it to be as good a neighbor as possible. Obviously, it just sits between the two buildings um, and by the time we get back to the river, we're back to zero, uh, zero foot candle, so no spillover. And as I indicated on photograph number Five from, from photo board number from uh, A1, uh, there's significant um, landscaping that would block both winter and summer views to the, the closest neighbor in the South Mountain District. The, uh, I think with regard to the uh, um, waivers, um, yeah, well, let, me, let me just go through the variance relief requested. Um, so we need, as indicated, a D variance. And the D variance, as you know, requires super majorities, meaning five vote, votes, positive votes. Um, and that is to replace a non-conforming commercial um, use, that's the retail sales, with another commercial use, that is the event space. We also need C variances for parking, as indicated by our, our uh, attorney. The current or the most recent user required 12 spaces, the proposed use, and, and we we did it not on square footage. We did it what we thought was the most conservative method, which would be when they put tables in and they have people having um, something to eat or requires uh, tables for a presentation. Um, we looked at the number of, um, of tables that can reasonably be uh, accommodated in that space. And we did it based upon a restaurant use of one space per three seats. And that uh, required 27 where again, zero provided. So our net increase, the, the site already comes with a 12 space deficiency, we're going up to 27. So the net increase in the parking requirement is 15 spaces. And as indicated, there'll be testimony provided that the applicant has secured a lease parking for 16 spaces that are roughly 205 feet away from the property. So if we go back to A2. Hey, Rich. Rich. Yep. Slow down this one side. Yep. Let's go back and why don't you, because I think you rushed through it a little bit, before you talk about the proximity of the proposed parking spaces to the site, mm -hmm. please go over slowly how you came up with the parking calculation. And let's assume for the moment that the board's going to determine because the, um, the, the, I guess the hobby shop hasn't been there for 15, 20 years, that we're not concerning ourselves with the parking requirement for that use. But why don't we talk about how you're calculating the parking requirement for the current space and the current use. Certainly. So let's go um, back to I was locked out of my office today with the gas main leak up at Columbo right in front of my office. So I worked from home, which was right next to the espresso machine. So if I'm talking too fast, it's because I <laughs> loaded up on espresso before I came here. Although, our, our uh, hey, hey, Rich, yes, we're not buying that. Okay. <laughs> You've been here too long. All right, let me just uh, find. Oh, okay, so here, um, if we go to sheet number three, um, it is because I always have espresso. Um, if you go to our parking calculations, you'll see that again. Um, Melbourne Train and Hobby hasn't been there for a while, but when they were there, it's 2,305 square feet at a uh, zoning ordinance criteria of one space per 200. Okay, hold on. And how many spaces is that? That's 11.52, which rounds up to 12. And then you talked about alternatively, you, you did a calculation based on the number of seats. We don't have a we don't have an ordinance requirement that defines a an event space, and so while 
Um, it could be any, and our, our client will talk about it. It could be a product launch opening. Um, some of the downtown stores have already expressed interest that their store is too small to have a product opening. They'd love a space like this. So whatever it is, there will sometimes be um, ancillary to another uh, commercial use in the town, an event, maybe a chamber of commerce uh, breakfast. Uh, but we recognize at some point there could be catering. And I would point out another um, clarification, and that is that our space has a kitchen area, but it does not have open flame cooking. It is only intended for heating and, and storing, um, refrigerated storing, heating, and serving of food. There's no actual preparation that will be done on site. The kitchen is not set up to do that. Um, it's our clients, the applicant's vision is when uh, an event is scheduled and they want food, they will contract catering from a local downtown restaurants who will then bring the food up to the back door, drop it off ahead of time, either get stored in the refrigerators or it gets heated and put out for consumption. Generally the face style, but not always. Um, and so we recognize that without any guidance, we talked to Eileen uh, Davitt a number of times as to whether it would be considered like a retail use at one for 200. Um, but we also recognize that it could also be seen more as a type of, of a restaurant type use, although there won't be waiters and waitresses to that extent. There won't be, you know, and, and parking numbers in the ordinance are empirically based for a use. So when you look at a one a requirement of one space for every three seats, it includes bus boys, it includes all the kitchen staff, it includes um, anybody who could work at that. And they come up with a number, this is based upon national studies, um, for every, the parking requirement is one parking space for every three seats. Okay, so, so is that requirement just for restaurants or does that also apply to what I'll call assembly? Um, it does apply to churches. So an assembly, it's, you know, we, we divide up pews in 21, 19 to 21 inch segments. Um, so assembly would also be one per three. Um, and that's what we do for, again, for churches. And that's really the only other assembly. So we did feel that it was uh, more correct to notice for um, the more conservative or more intense use, which would be um, uh, what we call assembly use seating criteria. And that is, as I said, consistent with uh, um, uh, assembly use, well, we, we call it uh, seating criteria, but um, if it was, uh, I think I actually say the whole thing, using seating, um, either way, we looked at a one per 80, and that's at one, uh, 80 seats were uh, what the architect felt was appropriate for the space. At one space for every three seats, that comes out to 26.67. So 27 spaces are required in the proposed condition. And again, if the board deems that it's been so long that the prior, ex prior use never existed, um, then we need a parking variance. We'll notice for a parking variance for 27 spaces. We think the increase over what's current um, is 15. And as indicated, we have, uh, we have made arrangements to get as many as 16 spaces about 205 feet away from the site. How many feet away? 203 feet. That was measured off the aerial. Uh, which is to scale at a one inch equals 50 scale. That's from the closest corner of our site to the closest corner of the parking lot is 203 feet. You can see the blue line is the 200 foot radius. So we're just outside that 200 foot uh, radius. And that is the area where of the 18 parking spaces located in Dr. Crosser's lot, we have uh, arranged to um, use up to 16 of those uh, during the non, essentially the non-business hours for Dr. Crosser. And the applicant will go over those hours. Um, Tony can go over them as well. But they do dovetail um, pretty exactly with the, uh, the ideal usage for this event space. Um, I've always driven by that. I drive by that site twice a day. And I've always remarked at how underutilized that parking lot is. Uh, in fact, 
at some point, I wondered if Dr. Crosser was still in business, and he clearly is, but um, there's no Saturday hours, there are limited uh, afternoon hours, and that's all in the parking lease, and it dovetails with the proposed usage by the applicant for their events. And obviously, they'll, since all events are scheduled, they'll tailor their events to meet that, to be consistent with the, uh, the parking uh, lease arrangement that's been put into effect. Do you know if Dr. Crosser received uh, any approvals from this board or the planning board as part of his use? Um, my office did the site plan years ago. Um, I couldn't find a resolution in my files, but we did um, We did a use variance for that years ago. For a use variance? I, I believe it was a use variance. Do you, do you recall approximately when? I, I, would, I would just show you how old I am. Does the fire department put a capacity on that building? Not to my knowledge. And the fire department has, they issued a letter and they had essentially no comment of them. They want a Knox box and they want AutoCAD plans of the space. So obviously we would we would never exceed um, any building or fire code regulations for that building. Generally, fire code is, is um, will allow more people generally than a restaurant even like. Right, and it just speaks to the, the volume of the parking. Mm -hmm. the calculation of it. So that's the um, that's the nature of what we're proposing on this. I've identified the variances. I just need to go through the waivers. Yes. Um, so the waivers that we're requesting. Turn to my plan. The waivers we're requesting um, waiver of environmental impact statement for a site plan. This is an existing fully developed site. There are no changes to the outside. Um, waiver of stormwater provisions. Tony and I always butt heads on whether we actually need this. I think there was an application where they found he did. Um, we don't need to provide stormwater because we are reducing the impervious area. Therefore, no stormwater uh, management is required, and none was indicated in the uh, engineer's report. We also need uh, a design waiver, uh, which was picked up by your planner. That's 516.3. That's the buffer to a residential use. Obviously, not one does not exist now, and it's not feasible for us to install a buffer or fencing uh, in the floodway. They're strictly prohibited. So, um, fencing. Uh, gets torn down, it ends up with the next culvert, blocks the bridge, and causes more flooding. The same with uh, with landscape material. That's uh, what we consider traditional landscape material. Mature trees are somewhat different, but uh, they're also um, um, they're not necessarily uh, um, don't want new plantings in those areas. So we need a design waiver from the buffer. We do not need a waiver for 516.4 because we're switching uh, from uh, concrete curve to granite block curve. So those are the uh, for the uh, three waivers that we need as part of this application. Mr. Chairman, I have no further uh, questions regarding similar to Mr. Keller. Any of the board have any questions for Mr. Keller? <laughs> any of the audience have any questions for Mr. Keller? Mr. Chairman, I call my next witness, Ms. Lisa Landers. Please write in. You swore in front of the testimony cast. You're about to get in time. So, see if you choose poultry, come to the truth. Your name for the Keep your voice up. Okay. Lisa Landers, L A N D E R S. Thank you. Ms. Landers, can you tell us uh, your professional <clears throat> credentials in the field of architecture and Sure. I'm a licensed architect in New Jersey since 2009, previously licensed in Maryland. Uh, my license is in good standing in New Jersey. I hold a Bachelor of Architecture and a Bachelor of Science in Building Sciences from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Uh, I am uh, the director of the corporate studio and a senior project manager uh, at Studio 1200 on Milburn Ave in Short Hills. And I have previously given testimony in Brick, New Jersey, and Baltimore, Maryland. This is my first time testifying here. Are you uh, active and in good standing? Yes, I am. 
Thank you. Your qualifications are accepted by this board. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Landers, can you tell the board or describe to the board the, the existing condition of the property? Sure. Uh, the property at 156 Main Street is, is in a state of disrepair, as previously discussed, due to deferred maintenance and for sitting vacant for so many years. Um, the existing building is a CMU structure uh, with a, a stucco uh, facade. Um, the existing roof is an asphalt shingle roof with a cupola, and they are in complete disrepair. Uh, the existing gutters and downspouts also are in need of repair. Uh, there are existing trims, moldings, and lighting, and lighting that will all be um, needing to be um, updated, and the Front doors and windows um, are would be removed, and the three side doors would also be replaced. Um, the existing any existing awnings that are still up on the building would be removed, as uh, some of them are already falling off. And there is an existing HVAC unit at the rear of the property um, that is beyond in disrepair and would be removed and replaced. The interior of the building. The interior is currently an open, mostly open area. There is an existing bathroom. There is an existing kitchen work uh, workshop type space and some storage within the building. Everything on the interior uh, due to the, the roof being in such bad shape needs to be completely gutted and um, re reworked um, so to make the building weather safe. What about the elevations? Did you speak about the existing? So just running through the exterior. So this is the the trim on the front of the building, there is some lighting. Um, okay, you're referring to this for the record for to A2. Yes, to A2, the west elevation, which is the main entrance. Um, so that is the existing storefront, the existing windows that we are proposing to remove. On the north side of the building, there are exist there's an existing window that we would keep and um, repair re as necessary, remove the existing awning, and replace the existing door. The roof, the cupola would be, would be removed, the cupola would be removed completely, um, and um, the existing stucco would be repaired and, and painted. Um, on the south elevation, both of the doors and the awnings uh, would be removed <coughs> and new doors replaced in the same location. And then at the rear, that is showing the existing HVAC unit, which is sitting on the ground. And there is some existing lighting at the rear as well. Let's not focus on your proposed plans for the uh, space. Each drawing state for the record. Which one? Yes. Okay. Um, so according to on A3, our proposed plans. Um, so our proposed uh, plan includes furring out all of the existing CMU exterior walls. Uh, they would be furred out with um, metal stud and insulation and drywall all the way around to, um, to comply with the energy code. Uh, that will also afford us some sound attenuation. Um, the, there will be restrooms towards the front of the building, similar location to where they are now. And then um, there will be a, a, a warming kitchen and storage um, at the, the rear of the building. So the, and there will also be a dedicated um, secured uh, trash area so the trash will be located within the building um, and a private carting surface will service will remove the trash after every event 
Uh, we are showing the uh, eight, ten, tape, eight, ten top tables um, for reference. Um, and the reasoning for that is because there's a lot of different ways that the applicant will uh, use the space. So we just wanted to kind of show the scale of what that would look like in that particular way. And that would allow space for people to enter into the space to be able to freely access the restroom, to freely access the kitchen. If there's product display, gift tables, DJ, whatever it is, there's room um, for, for that to occur uh, around the, the tables as well. And can you tell us what aesthetic improvements have been proposed? Sure. So on the exterior, uh, we are proposing to remove the existing front entry doors and the two windows and expanding that opening to be a, um, a larger storefront system, which would be double glazed um, for energy efficiency and for sound attenuation. Um, and the existing facade would be smoothed, the, stru the stucco would be smoothed out and get rid of all of the trim, lighting, anything that's out there currently. Um, and the, it would be painted, uh, the front facade would be painted white, which is, I guess we, this is A3. This is our paint color. Um, yeah, yeah, can you mark with the back or something? Yes. <laughs> So what is, I'm, I'm sorry, what, uh, Lisa, what is A3? A3 is our paint sample. Thank you. Is that interior, exterior? Exterior paint, yes. And while we're at it, we'll do A4, which is the storefront, the aluminum storefront, which would be black. So white smooth stucco facade, black storefront, double glazed. Uh, we are also proposing decorative sconces that flank the entrance, which would be this fixture noted on A4 here, the decorative sconce F2, uh, which is also black. Uh, we are also proposing a fixed awning above the entrance, um, which would also be black. And then the, um, the signage area with the, uh, the applicant signage, which would be pin mounted, not illuminated um, internally. And then we would provide a uh, light fixture above the signage, which would be this wall washer F1, which is a down light only. Uh, so the general idea is that clean up the front, make it all white, and then all of the accents on the front would be black. What about any uh, flooding improvements or measures? So the intention is for all of the doors to have um, integrated flood controls. So they would have a sleeve um, and then the if there were an, a flooding event that was predicted um, or a big storm coming, the owner would come and put their flood prevention measures in place. Does the building have a basement? It does not. Does the applicant uh, seek to use the rear yard? No. Mr. Um, Chairman, I have no further questions of this witness at this time. <clears throat> Any questions? Hi, Grant Petto, the planner. Um, just a question regarding the white finish. Is that is that the proposed uh, color finish for all sides of the building? The it white? is, yes. Uh, was, was there any thought or question about the northern facade, that adjacent foliage, the trees on the adjacent property, any concerns about, you know, staining or weathering or, you know, that white color being, so, you know, affected by that thing? Maintenance, what kind of maintenance would that entail? It, it, yeah, it is, it is stucco. It's, it's white-ish now. Um, so 
you know, I think that they would have to to clean it periodically. Um, but the nature of, of stucco is it's not as it doesn't harbor as much um, as a vinyl or something like that. Would, okay. So. Um, and one other question that I had, which um, I had asked uh, in the report, um, was the proposed signage that you're planning for. Uh, I know I understand it's individual pin mounted letters for yes. each letter. Um, I just was wondering if there was any consideration or thought to perhaps consider a raceway panel that way you could just have fewer pen penetration points and then put the lettering on that panel. Right. If it were into internally illuminated, I would definitely um, think that a raceway would be the best option. But since it is, um, it's not internally illuminated. Uh, so the idea is that the the signage has a little bit of dimension to it, and then you see the stucco behind it. So we prefer to stick with. Sure. That. Sure. Yeah. The, the my suggestion was that you do the panel and then pin mount to the panel. So that way, if there's a change in tendency, you take off the panel and instead. You know, we left a trifecta in an outline uh. <laughs> after, you know, not that I want you guys to, you know, be leaving the site, but just something to consider. Okay. That's all Thank I have. Um, will there be a generator on site? No, there will not. Okay. And what appliances will be in the kitchen? So the kitchen will have um, just a... Um, The kitchen will have a, a warming oven. Um, it, it will have a range, but just an electric range for heating up, not for actual cooking. Um, it will have a three compartment sink, a hand wash sink for staff, and then it would have a refrigerator and a freezer. So residential grade appliances really intended for having caterers, local businesses come in and having food be able to be heated up. So it would be difficult okay. to prepare a meal there. It was, it's only intended for reheating. That is the intention. Okay. And uh, so you really couldn't prep that. That's one of my questions. And um, the HVAC, are you going to redo that? Will there be noise control on that side? Yes. So the HVAC unit is actually um, on the, um, the east side. So the HVAC unit will be at the rear of the building. Um, it would be mounted on a platform platform above the floodplain as required. Um, but the unit itself is similar to a residential type unit. So it wouldn't be any louder than someone's home uh, type unit. Thanks. And uh, uh, just two last questions. There, uh, when I went by the building, it's, it's a cool building. There's these relief sort of faces on the outside. Are they going to come down or say that? I don't know if there's a cool history to them or not. Uh, the intention was to take them down, but um, if there's if there's some sort of cool history to yeah, them. Yeah. I don't know either, but it sort of stood out to me. And just lastly, um, I believe Mr. Keller answered this question, but it did, what also was striking about the property is how close the river is. For safety reasons, will there be alcohol served and how do you protect people who could be wandering around out there after consuming? Um, I would defer to the applicant to talk more about that. But if there were, if there was alcohol served, it would be in compliance with the uh, with the ABC laws, whatever um, you know, governs in terms of. Do they need an alcohol laws. license to serve there? No, not a like a liquor license. Yeah, liquor license. No. No. Well, so, so they could potentially serve alcohol there. Yes. Similarly to a, um, a BYO, like a restaurant. Right. That's and I know you said you couldn't put fence there, but I was concerned with how do you keep people from falling in the river, which is certainly very close. And it's like a 20, 30 foot drop, 25 foot drop into the river. But anyway. If you could go back to A2 real quick. Actually, go back to your interior real quick. Let me see the. Uh, a3. A3. How did you get to the 810 house? Um, we played uh, around with what felt comfortable in the space um, and really kind of allowed the applicant to do, you know, what they wanted to within the space without overcrowding it. Who wanted to more be accommodated? 
I mean, we got a big spot up here in the front. Yeah, but that's that's where people are coming in. If there's you know cocktails before there's or if you know I, this is just one configuration. Um, if it's a product launch, there may be sort of like display tables along the the center, but we would cap the occupancy at at eighty. So. Are those drawing the, are the tables in the drawing to scale to the space? Yes, they are. Okay. And in terms of capping occupancy, um, you talked, or maybe as Mr. Keller talked about uh, DJ activities. So if there's going to be a dance party there without tables, what's the anticipated capacity for that type of event or party? The occupancy is the occupancy, no matter how many tables and chairs you have in there. So it's still 80. Do you know what the, and I know um, the chairman asked about fire code. Do, do you know what building code or, or other regulations would uh, permit in terms of occupancy? Um, the building code for this occupancy, um, technically, uh, I don't have the exact, the exact calculation for that. Because um, if we look at, because it's not for the whole 2,300 square feet because we have the kitchen area, which has a different occupancy and the storage. Um, but we can- So you say it's 80. The problem is that fire code allows 120 in there. Well, we, it ha if it's a, there's a posted occupancy of 80, then the occupancy is 80. You can't have more than 80 in there. Mr. Chairman, we're, we're sticking to the 80 as a result of the parking calculation. Okay. Okay, and that'll include if, if there's drop-offs of, of kids for, for uh, DJ parties and all. Yes? Yes. And um, with regard to the interior space, are you going to have a, a, a built-in sound system, or if a DJ or some other music comes in, they're going to have their own sound system? It would it would be brought in. What was the last time this building started? Maybe Richard does. Yeah, it, it got, um, the front half had about eight inches of water um, that came back to about the midpoint during Ida. Um, generally what happens is the water is about, and I've walked through here um, in all the big four storms, um, the, uh, the water's about a foot to 15 inches, but it's moving with high velocity. So it doesn't actually get so much into the building, um, but it has, but that's the reason that, um, uh, they're putting these barrier systems, so there's there's grommets built into the frame that these panels just screw that they easily twist into. It's, it can be done by one person. Each panel gets mounted on top, and you can you can get protection to three four feet, so two feet above the, the flood elevation, relatively easy on the uh, on those new doors. So that's why we're doing those new doors in these areas, and uh, you can get that. And typically, it comes in from the west side, not actually the river side, correct? It, yeah, because we're completely sealed, other than a crack in the building back here, we're completely sealed on, on the side where the river is. And actually, the water doesn't often get, it, it doesn't get over the wall at this point. It's all really coming down, uh, as our other map showed, it comes down the west side on, uh, on Main Street. Yeah, from Taylor Park over there. From Taylor Park and from all the way from Charlie Grounds. Right. Any other questions? Clear up today. Just a brief one. Uh, where do people put their coats? Are they going to put them in? There is a coat closet oh. down here. Yes. Your show. Oh. Oh. Anyone, uh, yeah, anyone in the audience have any questions? We are done. No. Mr. Chairman, I call Ms. April Belusi. April Owusu, O W U S U. Are you the uh, owner? Yes, I am the owner of Trifecta Event Space. And can you tell the board your credentials in life and why you got involved in, in event space? Okay, well, first off, good evening, everyone. I'm very excited to meet you all. Um, it's been several months of planning leading up to this very moment. So thank you for your time and attention to our application. Um, I am speaking tonight on behalf of myself and my husband, Stanley. He's, he 
here tonight. He's sitting right there. Um, by profession, we are nurses. Um, we've been in the medical field for over a decade. Um, I received my bachelor's in nursing from William Patterson University and my master's in nursing from Monmouth University. Currently, I am working as a nurse practitioner in the surgical department at Inglewood Health. Um, my husband received his bachelor's in nursing from Rutgers University. He's currently obtaining his master's in business administration with the University of Arizona via their global campus. Currently, he is a director in the finance, nursing finance department at Jersey City Medical Center, which is through the RWJ Barnabas Health System. Um, we find, although we are very proud of our nursing profession, it is our absolute dream to open up an events-based business. Um, we find great joy in organizing and putting an event together. We've done it numerous times for not only ourselves, but friends and family. Um, in fact, in the workplace, we're often tasked with uh, and heavily involved with organizations, whether um, organ organizing events, whether it be um, holiday parties or celebration for accreditation, for instance. Um, so when we came across the property at 156 Main Street, we felt that it was a perfect fit for um, Trifecta. Um, it, it's on a busy road, so there's high visibility. Our guests will be able to locate us fairly easily. Um, we loved its proximity to Taylor Park. We envision our guests possibly going there after an event and taking pictures and then heading downtown to check out the local businesses and shops. Um, as you've heard, the building has been vacant for quite some time, so that empty space really allowed us to create exactly what we envisioned. Um, we frequent Milburn often. Our youngest son goes to daycare here in Milburn. Um, we have three kids, so our pediatrician is also in Milburn. Um, and once we were really interested in the location, we started attending um, uh, meetings held by the Chambers of Commerce here. And we shared an idea, our idea for the space. And it was really well received by other business owners. Um, we really got a sense that uh, an event space like Trifecta, which would be um, high end with a customizable floor plan, modern and sleek, um, was really needed in the town. Um, so uh, in regards to operations, um, we would be open Monday through Sunday. Um, so seven days a week, starting at 11 a.m. until closing by appointment only. Um, so if a client or a guest was interested in our space, they can telephone us with their inquiry or go on our website where they'll be able to put in what event they're anticipating to have, um, anticipated number of guests, date, and time, right? And depending on the information received, it will determine whether or not we can accept the booking since we'll, we will be complying with the parking lot agreement terms. So if it was a larger event, which we define greater than more than 10 guests, then we may have to respectfully decline if it's requested outside of the parking lot agreement because the last thing we would want is for our guests to have to go through the hassle of finding parking. Um, when it comes to the events itself, um, there, there will only be one event going on at a time, so there will be no two events going on simultaneously. Um, however, there may be more than two events that occur in one day. So the way that we would stagger that would be morning versus evening. So a morning event can take place maybe from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m., and then the evening event can take place starting 5 or 6 p.m., for, in for instance. Um, and that allows time in between for like sanitation, cleanup, and set it, setting up for the event number two, for instance. Um, also dependent on the number of anticipated guests, it will determine how many Trifecta Events Place employees will be warranted on site. So if it were like a smaller event, say like we rented out for a, a photo shoot or something, like a maternity photo shoot, um, that would probably only warrant one of trifecta event space employee. Who would that be for 
myself, my husband. Um, if it were a larger event, like a small intimate wedding reception, that may require maybe three or four trifecta events place um, employees to help handle the food, um, making sure um, that the event is going smoothly, um, cleaning up throughout the event, things like that. Um, speaking of food, you guys have already heard our plans of partnering up with hopefully the local restaurants that can um, cater our events. Um, they can drop off the food an hour or two prior to the event start time. Um, a trifecta event space, space employee will be able to accept the delivery and assist with warming and prepping prior to serving. Um, after the event, the trash is going to be kept inside of the building um, in an enclosed area. Uh, and we really did that with our neighbors in mind because we don't want any issues with like odors or rodents or anything like that. Um, also with our neighbors in mind, if there was ever an event that did require music, for instance, like a children's birthday party where there's a DJ, we would we plan to station the DJ right in the very front of the building with the speakers facing towards the rear to help with volume control. I mean, regardless, there's always gonna be a trifecta event space employee to make sure that the volume is kept to a reasonable level. Um, the reputation of trifecta is our priority, right? So we wanna be viewed by the community members and our neighbors as a high end event space. So we're gonna ensure that we are viewed as such. Um, I think I may have covered most of it. Um, I mean, again, this is, we just want to be able to create a space where members of the community and um, their families will be able to hold memorable events that they can cherish for a lifetime. So on Tuesdays and Thursdays, you don't get the party until 8 p.m., is that correct? Correct. So what do you plan on doing on Tuesdays and Thursdays? So you don't have a party. We may have to be closed. Or if it was like a photo shoot, like a maternity photo shoot or something with a smaller event, then we may be able to accept that if, if they were able to find street parking or even park on our driveway. So um, what what would you not host there? What would be off limits to you? Oh, that's one thing I didn't mention. So types of events that we plan on hosting, um, like we wouldn't throw like crazy parties or anything like that. The, the events that we anticipate on having and that what we hope to attract would be corporate business meetings, like workshops, seminars, product launches, networking events, personal events, of course, such as birthday celebrations, um, baby showers, um, bar mitzvahs. Sure, I can just um, bar mitzvahs. Um, maybe an intimate wedding reception, proposal, engagement parties, um, and then hopefully community events as well, right? So maybe trivia night, donation drives, um, Zumba or ballroom dance classes, and like a, a meet and greet with Santa or something. It's like a, it's like a Zumba or ballroom class. How would you accommodate that but during certain times of the week where you don't have this part? So that's the thing. We would we would be limited to what we can accept. If if it's if if somebody's requesting an event and we don't have Dr. Crosser's lot, then we would have to respectfully decline, and we wouldn't be able to accept that. Because your parking is very restricted. I mean, Friday have, you'll get till three. You know, Tuesdays and Thursdays, not till eight p.m. Even on even on a, on a Saturday, you don't have until twelve. Yeah. Well, we anticipate most of our events uh, to take place hopefully on the weekends, and. Any other questions? What if Dr. Crosser changes his mind about renting the parking to you? Do you have a contingency plan for that to back up? Um, we don't currently, but at, if that were ever to be the case, then we would, you know, explore other options. For example, though, the, the agreement is possibly a 10-year term. But it's renewable every year. Correct. And, and it's a license agreement. It's, it's not a lease. lease. So it can be terminated by him at any time. It's a license. It's permission, right, to, to park, but it can be rescinded by him. If there's a violation, or if there's a violation. 
So it's Thursday night, 8 p.m. You get the lot. Snow's two inches. What happens? Just for your lease, for your license, you have to be off the lot by 9 p.m. So what do we do for snow, you're asking? Like so you start a party at eight o'clock on yeah, a Thursday night. Yeah. Snow's two inches. And per your license, you have to be off that lot by 9 p.m. So what is everyone gonna do? So hopefully we would see the weather ahead of time. And if we have to cancel due to inclement weather, then we will. It would be put in our contract with the guests that that could be a possibility. Um, in terms of snow removal and things like that. Um, the agreement speaks for itself. The, oh no, the agreement speaks for snow removal. The but property owner is required to maintain the lot. Oh yeah, but, but like I said, in this agreement it also says that in two inches of snow you have to vacate the lot by 9 p.m. So that's why I'm asking. Two inches of snow is not a lot of snow. Mm. But it effectively shuts you down. Yeah, so, I mean, we would hopefully plan ahead of time and check the weather and see what they're predicting. Okay. Yeah. What, when is closing? Um, there's, there's references here to closing. Yeah, so it'll vary. Um, we I noticed that other restaurants like are open until 2 a.m. 2 a. Yeah, 2 a.m. Maybe we wouldn't go past that. What about noise ordinance? Well, they'd comply. Of course. Of course, yeah. Any other questions for the board? Anything else? Oh, sorry, I think yeah. I want to. Sure. Have, have, have you approached other folks? I, I assume you have, besides John Bird Costa, about parking, about a similar agreement like that? Um, just one other. Um, Mr. Silverstein um, at 75 Main, but he's already renting out to another restaurant and um, he has tenants in the building already. So, I just had two quick questions. One, um, regarding trash collection or removal of the trash from the interior storage, um, will a truck have to maneuver into your loading area to pick that up or will that be wheeled out to the street and collected? Um, and you also talked about you know, back-to-back -back events, like how will right. that be managed? Yeah, so it's a pri it'll, it'll be a private carter service. Mm -hmm. um, they may have to back up the truck into the loading area if it's quicker, but we can also bring it out to the front um, if needed. Um, the trash after the event, if it were like two in one day, you're saying, it, right. it, would, it would just be kept in that enclosed area until the next morning. Okay. Um, and my second question was, um, you know, we've talked a lot about parking, um, but what about um, like pickup or drop off on site? Are you aware of what the on street regulations are in front of your building? And, you know, is there space to do that idling for a drop off situation? Or There is space. Um, like if somebody were to take like an Uber or a Lyft, um, they can like, pull over to the side and I don't know, I'm not familiar with the actual like rules of that, but um, there is a like a street parking right in front, okay. off to the right in front of like the where the dry cleaners and the nail. So on it. Okay. There's no parking in front of your facility, correct? No. Correct. Uh, any questions for the from the audience? Please for this. I'd like to call Dr. Scott Cross. Mr. Cross, I'm going to show you this parking lot agreement. Is that your signature? It is. <coughs> have you authorized Trifecta to utilize your parking lot? I have. And when you uh, have your dental practice and there's some snow, uh, what do you do with your existing patients? Um, they usually stop coming when it snows. <laughs> um, if there's snow on the ground, we uh, we salt a lot for, um, I have a service that comes in and, and, and cleans. I have no further questions with Dr. Cross. So Dr. Cross, I had asked Mr. Keller earlier. Um, did you uh, receive a, you mentioned a use variance that you received for the use of your property. And when was that, box one? 95, 96. 
And did you receive, um, to, your, to your recollection, any type of site plan approval in connection with the use of your property? I assume we had a site plan that was. But if you don't know, you don't remember. No, I, I don't really recall exactly. Do you, do you recall um, seeing or receiving a memorializing resolution as to the approval you received in about 1995 or the conditions of that approval? I remember that there was an, an approval of it at, at the following meeting. And did that approval um, address parking at your property? Whether you needed a you needed a parking variance at the time, if you recall. I think we had enough parking. Okay. I, I don't think we needed a variance for parking. We needed just the usage variance. It was a previously existing non-conforming usage prior to us taking over the property. There was a gas station. Contaminated. Shocking. <laughs> Shocking. Right. Any other questions for uh, Dr. Crosser? Any questions from the audience? Thank you, Dr. All right. Mr. Richard Keller. Can you tell the board the basis for the uh, request of relief? Certainly. As indicated, we need a D1 use variance. Um, to qualify for that, we need to demonstrate positive criteria or special reasons, uh, as well as that we're complying with the negative criteria, which is there's no substantial detriment to the public good, and there's no substantial impairment to the intent and purpose of the zone plan and zoning ordinance. With regard to special reasons, um, the applicant needs to show that we advance um, any of the 16 purposes of zoning defined by municipal land use law under section 4055 D2. Um, and of the purposes um, uh, in that section that we advance, first off is section A, which is safety and general, general welfare. Uh, we are eliminating a longstanding 20 year vacancy um, with more than 20 years of deferred maintenance at the Sutherland Gateway to the Township. Um, we are also advancing the section uh, uh, also A, which are we are securing the site um, from uh, safety uh, in case of flooding by providing uh, increased flood resiliency through the addition of the flood proofing measures on the property. We are advancing section G, which is to provide for a variety of commercial uses um, to meet the needs of the community and all citizens. Um, and also contributing to the well-being of persons, neighborhoods, and communities. We're providing an event space uh, that can supplement existing uses within the nearby B4 Central Business District. Um, I'm on the board of the Chamber of Commerce. I was actually kind of surprised by a lot of the, uh, the comments from other merchants in the downtown that they thought this would be a great idea. Um, it's actually, other than multifamily housing, the, the only... Um, inquiries we've had on this property in the last 15 years never has been retail. It's always been some form of, of residential work I to, to tell them wasn't possible. And the only other one was a downtown restaurant that wanted to look at using this as an ancillary event space, but they wanted to do cooking on site and we thought it was not a good idea. Um, so certainly um, there seems to be a demand within the community um, uh, that can be met. And I think we're certainly promoting a desirable visual environment um, through taking a building that is um, really sticks out like a sore thumb and as an embarrassment when you come into our downtown um, and making it, as indicated by the architect and the owner, kind of uh, elegant, chic, restrained, uh, and certainly more attractive. And finally, um, I think we're also promoting the conservation of um, energy resources through the use of shared parking. Shared parking has become uh, a regular part of many of the towns we work in where they encourage shared parking. Uh, especially where you can show that the hours can dovetail. In this particular case, yes, there are some restrictions, um, such as Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, those are not, Thursdays may be the exception, but Tuesdays generally are not big event evenings. And the applicants have indicated that their pro forma works uh, fine about working around those parking uh, 
requirement agreements. The, um, um, so in addition to advancing those six purposes of the act, um, case law also demands that we need to show that the site is particularly suited for the proposed use um, to further promote general welfare. Uh, and the caveats is that um, demonstrating that the site is particularly suitable for the proposed use does not require proof um, that there is no other potential location for this use in the community. So you could find another possible location that you think might be good. Um, it doesn't necessarily affect the site suitability of this use to this site. Um, and it, nor, nor does it demand evidence that a permitted use couldn't work on the property. Now we've demonstrated that pretty much any of the permitted use in terms of residential don't work. Um, and there's been, with decreased emphasis on retail, um, a movement in the downtowns, so it's saving downtowns or experiential uses, um, uh, a retail is not going to work there. And so clearly, uh, the ones that are saving our downtown, saving our commercial districts are experiential, and that's what this group proposes. And as I said, in my experience with this property in over 20 years, it's really the only interest that's the viable interest or permittable interest that we've seen in this property. So we think that uh, this site is particularly suited for the proposed use uh, in terms of the applicant indicating it's perfect in terms of its size and its proximity to the downtown. Uh, and also that it is in close proximity to an underutilized commercial parking lot um, where the hours do dovetail with the applicant's proposed operations. And they're willing to um, submit to that they will continue to do that. They will. They have the opportunity to book events or not book events based upon the availability of that parking. Um, they're not planning on using parking, but there is, there is parking uh, in front of street parking. There is parking in front of the nail salon. There's parking across the street for a few spaces. There is non-striped, non-metered spaces, about 21 spaces that go from Ridgewood up to Taylor Street uh, along Taylor Park. Um, those, at some times of the day, are fairly open. Sometimes they're not. Um, but certainly, um, there is the possibility that people will come to the park, come to the event, go back to the park and says for a photo opportunity, and then uh, go to the downtown. So the site, uh, we think, is... Um, particularly suited for proposed use, and certainly it is uh, it is not viable or in demand for any of the permitted uses um, for the property. Um, with regard to, so I think we uh, we can demonstrate particular site suitability and advance the positive criteria. With regard to the C variances, so I'll talk about C variances for a second before I get to the negative criteria. C variances generally are considered to be subsumed within the D variance. When you go for a use variance, you generally consider that uh, the benefits of that uh, variance, um, it, it uh, um, naturally meets the uh, the positive criteria. I think we can argue both the parking and the signage variance under C1 and C2, respectively, of municipal land use law criteria. Um, first of all, with regard to the parking, we think a C1 uh, criteria applies, and that is because the site is fully developed with no ability to add parking. So the size and shape of the property combined with the location of the river, combined with the um, size and location of the lawfully existing structure, um, all creates a hardship in carving out, whether it's 12 spaces or 27 spaces, um, you're not going to create it on this site. Um, with regard to the signage, and I got distracted before um, in going to particulars of, of the signage, just to quickly reiterate what the sign variance involves. The, um, obviously we're in a residential zone which doesn't really anticipate any kind of building signage or, or, um, or other kinds of signage. So it's very restrictive allowing two square feet of area and a ma maximum graphic of one foot. It's really meant for an apartment or a, or a house. Um, the previous tenant had 25 square feet of signage with a 4.25 foot height. Um, What's proposed is about two thirds of that at 16 and a half square feet total with a height of one and a half feet. Um, that's 16.5% uh, that's uh, represents about 3% of the 544 square feet of facade area that's sort of below the curve. So um, that represents about 3% of the total facade area. And by, um, by comparison in the nearby B3, uh, which is the shop right and, uh, and I think the uh, the Palumbos, as well as the B4, which is our downtown, uh, that permits 20% of facade area and 24 inch high graphics. So we're talking about one sixth of that um, in terms of square footage at 3%. And 
and, uh, and significantly less in terms of the height. Uh, the nearby CMO zone, which is where my building is, uh, down past Palumbo, that permits 10% of the facade area, uh, and again, we're only 3%. So you can see that these, these numbers are not large. It's fairly restrained, and I think the architect's drawings show that it is uh, well uh, proportioned and elegant compared to the size of the building, and elegant in terms of the black uh, pin-mounted letters against the uh, new smooth stucco white finish. So that's that's the, the variance that's required. Uh, we think that's really a C2 variance, which is the flexible variance, where we think it's a better planning alternative to allow for appropriate signage on this building. Um, it allows for uh, identification to motorists so they can safely see the site, um, make accommodations to either then um, uh, know where they're going to uh, go and, and then the relationship of that to the parking, all of which would be handled in an email, by the way, in advance. So uh, anyone coming, booking, uh, booking the uh, party would get a map showing where the parking is located and where the facility is located. The signage is always needed on any commercial. So we think it really advances public safety and aesthetics um, and can be granted under uh, C2. With regard to the negative criteria, um, the two prongs, no substantial detriment to the public good. Um, we think that uh, there's certainly no de detriment to the character of the neighborhood. There is no activity at the rear of the site. Um, no cooking on site, um, no open flame cooking on site. Obviously, there is a stove, but it's meant for heating. There's no requirement for ventilation, so there's no odor being produced into the neighborhood. Uh, there's no need for an Ansel, an Ansel fire suppression system. There's no open flames. Uh, so again, no loud noises, no fans, no odors, etc. Uh, the new windows and double door, um, double uh, doors, double glazed uh, windows and doors uh, will aid in sound attenuation as well as the new insulation uh, throughout the. The, uh, on the inside of the CMU, the concrete masonry units. Um, the, uh, the parking variance is mitigated by the 16 car lease agreement and the fact that they're willing to live with that stipulation. Um, obviously, any uh, uh, we, we don't always know you're going to get two inches of snow, but the applicant will have to put it in their lease that if this is a snow event and Dr. Crosser really needs the plows to get in there at 9 a.m., 9 p.m., and not 2 a.m., but they'll make accommodations. The um, as with any um, any application, there's always some negative impact. So the question becomes, is that negative substantial? And on net, do the benefits of this application, re-energizing this long vacant site, uh, do they outweigh any detriments? And we certainly think they do. With regard to the master plan, no impairment to the master plan zoning ordinance, uh, the primary goals and objectives of the master plan is one, to encourage appropriate land uses the character of the township is a small suburb of the highest quality. This intends to be an elegant um, use to support the community. Um, and I think it does protect the character of an established neighborhood. This is not a disco. It's not, um, um, I think there's, can there be abuses? Certainly. But there are noise laws in, in place. And if they get cited for noise of uh, violations, then it's going to endanger, endanger the business model. And I think that, um, I think sometimes we need to trust that businesses will do the right thing. Sometimes restaurants haven't in the past, but I think that the benefits clearly outweigh any possible detriments here. Um, goal number four of the master, the 2018 master plan, is to maintain the economic and enhance economic vitality of the downtown and other business districts. Um, this is not a business district, but it certainly spans between two business districts and it has a lot of business uses. And I'll talk about how the master plan kind of anticipates that. Um, Objective uh, 4.03 is to leverage opportunities for new commercial development or redevelopment of existing properties where appropriate. And we think that certainly applies here. Um, and we think that this actually will strengthen the existing business center, uh, including the downtown um, core. So we don't think it's inconsistent with the master plan. Whenever you need a use variance, the, the, uh, there is an, there is a uh, under the Medici court, there's an enhanced burden of proof. And that's that we can say this is a great use. We need to reconcile the omission of this use from the master plan. If we think it's such a good use, why didn't the framers of the master plan make it a permitted use? And usually it's because it's a new use and it hasn't been anticipated. However, in this case, in the 2018 master plan, in section on page 53, the recommendations were um, that specifically uh, the uh, they should examine whether lots in the R8 zone along Main Street should be rezoned for office slash commercial uses to better reflect current patterns. <coughs> so clearly there is, bless you, there is some anticipation that um, this really it does act as a commercial court based upon the existing uses. 
the Casa Colombo is across the street, right next to Dr. Uh, Crosser. Um, they provide, um, I, don't think the, I don't think you'll get Zumba here because they provide Zumba there, um, right opposite the R7s on behind them. Um, they similarly have business network meetings at 8 a.m. Um, where there's a, um, where at 8 a.m. there's ample parking in those 21 spaces in front of the park. Um, so if it's in a day where they can't park at Dr. Crosser's and there's a 15, 20 minute, uh, person business meeting, you certainly could accommodate something like that and not overburden your, your parking area. And it already happens in the neighborhood. Now there's a small lot behind Casa Colombo, but there's also some street parking there too, as there is in this case. So I think that um, there's a recognition in the master plan that uh, this, um, that the area really should be reconsidered um, as appropriate for office commercial uses to better reflect the current development patterns. I think that on balance, on net, this is good for the community. Um, I think that is there a possibility um, that there could be some negatives? Yes. Um, but I think the benefits outweigh the detriments. Um, with regard to the rear entrance, there is about a seven to eight foot drop because um, I, I knew I could get down the drop, but I didn't think I'd get back up the drop because I was going to take a picture from there. Um, down into the water, there's about a two and a half foot high wall there. Um, but that rear door is for deliveries. And while it is an emergency egress, it, the, the primary ingress and egress would be the front door. So if there's somebody who's coming to a party, they're going to be leaving by Main Street. And it's the same issue whether you're coming out of Standard or um, uh, or Moonshine. Obviously, there's traffic in close proximity. You can go across to the to the to the park where there's no walls along the river. So clearly, um, you know, this is not um, intended to be a saloon, um, but people are directed out to the front doors and that's where they'll be. And I, and I think that um, it's not something we have to worry about in our downtown where you have someone dangerous. I think that uh, we are 600 feet away from the downtown. Uh, and I think that uh, um, there's really not an issue with that rear entrance. And again, unfortunately, we can't put fences up, so we can't take any proactive measures. Uh, but again, that's that door is for um, for deliveries and for emergency egress, but not for normal operations. So I think that um, we think it is um, we've been waiting for a use to come in that is appropriate for this site for some 20 years. We think this is um, out of all of them, this is by far the best, and certainly never had a never had a, a, a retail uh, inquiry, and, uh, and it's clearly the residential will not work given current. Proposed DP regulations. We think it's a good application for the site, uh, and we ask that you approve it. So, you got the Casa Colombo, mm -hmm. you have VFW. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Chairman, can I answer one second? Oh, sure. I know where you're going. Well, I was, hey, Rich, can you, can you put up, what is it, A2, the aerial, please? So, so to the chairman's question that I rudely interrupted, <laughs> if you can, for the for the board's edification and the edification of the public, just and go ahead, Craig, in terms of your question. But it would be helpful, I think, if you orient the board as to where these particular uses are located proximate to the proposed location. Certainly. On, on A2. If we come from uh, the right side of the drawing, um, the barrel vaulted building is shop right. That's actually in the B3 district. And then we go to the uh, R8 district right next to it. Uh, right next to it is the, um, the Lakeside Village Apartments. But right across the street on Meeker, an apartment building, the next building in right next to Dr. Crosser's building is the Casa Colombo. Okay, so, so stop right there. Yep. What is the approximate distance from the those residential buildings that you were just describing and, and the subject site. Approximately. Which subject site are you talking about? Well, the, the applicant site. Applicants, okay. Well, can I want to give you a minute, Casa Colombo version? No, no, no. Applicant site to, to the res, those residential buildings that you were just describing. Um, to the uh, closest building at Lakeside, you are talking about um, 570 feet um, to Lakeside, and right next to that is the VFW site. So 570 feet to the Lakeside Apartments. Correct. 
Next to the next to the lakeside, you have the VFW site, which is approximately 470 feet from the site. And right next to that, you have a medical office building. That medical office building is approximately 420 feet. And then you have four single family dwellings. And then you come into an apartment building that is uh, about 95 feet to the south. On the opposite side of the street, coming from Meeker Place, there's an apartment building that measures 470 feet, 450 feet away, excuse me. The Casa Colombo, the closest part of that site is about 360 feet to Casa Colombo. As indicated, you've got 203 feet um, measured by our survey, actually, to the, to the property for Dr. Crosser. And then across the street, approximately um, 70 feet from our building, 72 feet away, there's an apartment building across the street, a three-story apartment building. And across the other side of the parking lot, at 90 feet away, there's also another two-story, it's either two or three-story, I don't remember, apartment building. And then obviously, um, as we continue to move west, uh, north, excuse me, you've got, uh, you know, we're approximately 200 feet to the St. Stephen's campus. And then, in, as indicated earlier, I think we are uh, actually 520 feet to the start of the B4 central business district. Okay. And your point on the left for, by the medical building, it was Dr. McGlone's old building. Correct. And to the right is the nail salon and the cleaners. Medical office building, formerly Dr. McGlone, and to the right is the laundry and nail salon. So, being that you have the VFW Hall, uh, we have Casa Colombo, and since you did mention the Chamber of Commerce, why do you feel a third event space would be ideal in this location? Um, it's a good question. I, I you know, um, we've never um, the VFW, while it does provide an easier access to alcohol, it's never had that feeling of elegance that a clean um, um, new space would provide. It's also, it lacks that proximity to the B4 district and Taylor Park. So I think this is actually an improved area for smaller events. I think the VFW um, is fine. Um, as I said, most of the people I know have gone there is because it's, uh, uh, it's, it's got a better access to, uh, uh, to alcoholic beverages. Um, I've never been to an event. To, actually, I went to a business um, network meeting years ago, breakfast meeting at Casa Colombo. Um, similar, um, it has a, it has more of a, uh, um, an older feel to it. Um, certainly, um, they are viable. Um, but I think what actually makes this more appropriate is it's closer to the downtown. And both those places have parking, correct? They do have parking. they not, um, the Casa Colombo is a fairly small lot behind it. Um, most of the parking ends up on, on bigger network events, ends up in the street or Zumba ends up in the street. Uh, the VFW does have a large lot. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Keller? Any questions from the audience for Mr. Keller? I see none. Who's your testimony? Any comments from the audience regarding any testimony that was made this evening? Then in that case, I'll close the public portion of the meeting. So this is a, a, a D1 use variance with uh, some bulk variances and some waivers. I think uh, Mr. Keller, to his credit, um, accurately described the relief requested and also set forth um, the criteria to be considered by the board and as also included in Graham's uh, review memo um, for the positive and negative criteria, particularly with regard to the, uh, to the D1 use variance. And considering that the bulk variances are essentially subsumed into the D1 use variance, meaning that um, when you have a use that's not permitted in the zone, that the bulk standards that are uh, applicable to that zone don't necessarily apply to 
this particular use because it wasn't contemplated in the first place. So as a result of that, um, you have to consider the, the, the testimony from the various witnesses um, in terms of whether you believe that the positive criteria and the negative criteria, and Mr. Keller talked about particular suitability uh, of the site for the use, and then also talked about the negative criteria that we're all familiar with, and also significantly talked about um, what he appropriately referred to as the enhanced quality of proof uh, under the Medici case when you're dealing with a D1 use variance for a proposed commercial use. And just to remind the board that um, there's seven of you, uh, it needs five affirmative votes to, uh, to be deemed approved. And that you may want to, if you're, depending on how you're considering the application, there's always an opportunity to suggest um, what amount to reasonable conditions of the use if you're inclined to uh, consider the use. Thank you, Rob. So with that, what comments does the board have? Um, so I, I guess I'll start. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not against the idea of having an event space um, in, in the town, in the downtown area. I just don't know that I can agree that this site is particularly suited to the use. Um, the, the parking hours and the, the, the whole parking agreement is very concerning to me. Uh, I, I just, I don't understand how that's gonna work. Um, the Tuesday and Thursday 8 p.m. start time is to me basically guaranteeing that you know, in, in order to run this business, you're, you're guaranteed to have late parties on you know two weeknights a night. Um, you know, this location is surrounded by you know residential use. I'm concerned about noise. Um, I don't agree that that you know noise is something that's that's really enforceable in this town. I think that you know many of us on the board know you know from living here that. Um, that, that it's just, it's, the, you know, the noise ordinances are, are not very enforceable. Um, I, I just, I, I'm not, I'm not convinced that the benefits um, to this application outweigh the detriments. I'm certainly not closing off my mind to it. I'd be curious to see what everyone else has to say, but um, I, I definitely have concerns. So I'll go next. So I, I would echo almost exactly what you said. Uh, my the, the use variance is one thing. What I, what I, uh, do I think we did a third event space within you know, a few hundred feet of each other? I'm not sure that that is necessary in this area. But the other two event spaces, whether it be the VFW or the um, Casa Columbia, do have on-site parking. You could argue how much, but they do have on-site parking. The parking, while it may be a C1 uh, variance for a hardship, I find that the cure in this case is incredibly restrictive and that uh, to run a business with this type of restrictive parking uh, agreement uh, license as it may be would make it very difficult to run this and not put a significant impact on the neighboring whether it be you know willow or spring or you know any of the streets over there where it would be putting a lot of, of commercial parking on the residential streets, which those streets are already very difficult to park on. Uh, so that that part of it for me, I, I really don't think I've seen a cure that um, that it as as uh, Jessica echoed where the, the benefits do outweigh the detriments. So I'll, I'll go. Sure. Um, and and I agree with a lot of what we said, but I have I guess my take on it is slightly different. I think that. Um, Clearly, it was shown that there are very limited uses that can go on this site and that the permitted uses are not allowed. And it sat vacant for a very long time. And I love the idea of reactivating the, the site and having it fixed up and having you know people use it and not sitting vacant so close to Taylor Park and what's essentially like the gateway to our downtown. But I agree uh, about the parking. It's a limitation on, on the business model. And I don't know if it's, I mean, can they make their business work with those parking limitations? That's their choice. I don't think it's our choice. I would be happier 
personally, if there was a maybe a second agreement for more parking, especially considering that, you know, I think you said you need 27 spaces and this agreement is for 16 of them. So it would be nice if, if you had approached others maybe and had a second agreement or some other arrangement that was better for the business. But but I, I do like I, I do like the use and the, the idea of activating the site and I can't imagine you know what else could possibly take that space and, and, and use it. Yeah, I have to say, I agree with those comments. I think, I mean, this place has been such an eyesore. Um, obviously, we have to be very concerned about um, how it will be used and what the potential consequences of that are. But I, I just think that that is not a positive for our town, that this that this site is sitting there unused for so long. And I walked around it today. I mean, it is terrible disrepair. Um, and so... Um, so I, I, I agree with the concerns, but I also think that, um, you know, there's not much else that's going to be able to go there. So, um, I, and I do think that the parking issue is real, and I think they're, the, the applicants are going to have to think about what that means for their business model. Because if they're going to have to shut down, you know, uh, either they're going to start their parties late, whether people want to start their parties at 8 o'clock, um, depending on the nature of the party, I don't know. If it starts to snow, they're going to have to clear out. Um, those are real considerations from a business model perspective. But uh, I do, I really would like to see this space used, and I don't know how it's going to be used otherwise. Um, I agree with all the comments that have been made so far, but I have to say personally, I'm thrilled that somebody would want to take that beautiful old building. It is really a cool building and rehabilitated to uh, to something that's useful. Um, I've been to Casa Colombo for an event. I've actually never been to the VFW. Um, and uh, I think it would be a great addition to town to have something new where people could have their personal events. Um, so um, with regard to parking, um, I agree that there could be some possibly an addi additional creative solutions for the parking, such as valet parking somewhere. That you could offer to your clients if you could if that is something that you could explore um but but from my, and uh, thank you for addressing the issue about the river which of course has been a hazard for many years so this is nothing new it's 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 just a hazard and it so far hasn't seemed to have been a problem perhaps you might consider security um so that that doesn't become an issue but um i believe that the positives outweigh the negative and i would support the application yeah, I share the concerns over parking primarily, um, but then again, there is there is you know if you if you walk up, I mean you have to walk a little ways, but there certainly is plenty of parking up on Main Street if you go further to, toward the downtown. Spring Street, Meeker Place, I mean it, it does exist, and to have this, as people have turned an eyesore, turned into something which is usable, valuable, and Really, a nice addition to the you know a nice addition to that area. I I, I, I too agree that uh, the benefits outweigh the detriments, and I would support this application. I guess I'll go last. Um, I do agree with everything everyone said. Um, I would support the application, um, though I do think the parking is a bit of an issue. I do think though the issue will be more on the applicants of making their business successful. Um, but I think that aesthetically rejuvenating it and bringing business there and working with the downtown, I think all of that does outweigh the parking problem. So. And, and I'll go further just to say that you know, given that it has been vacant for so long, and the potential uses are so limited. I mean, because I'm thinking about applications that have come before this board prior to this one, you know, with respect to you know, parking and other similar issues have come up. It's, you know, it's it's almost always in a space which has more utility than what we're looking at in this particular space. And, you know, it, it'd be exactly what is the business that's supposed to go here is it or is it simply do we or you just expect somebody to simply tear it down and build another smaller structure with its own parking lot and put in that kind of investment um i'm not sure that that's a reasonable expectation i think you know having you know given that the, the enthusiasm that the applicant is showing here 
what they're you know proposing to do, uh, how this proposes to improve that that stretch of street there. Again, I would just reiterate my support for it. So, if the board or um, supermajority board is in favor of the application, as I stated in my um, instruction, so to speak, um, those members can consider whether they want to impose any conditions associated with the proposed use, whether it's hours, whether it's parking, um, or nothing. You can just you know, do what you wish based on the testimony that you've heard in connection with the, in connection with the application. So if, if somebody's going to make a motion, that can be considered or not. Well, what, what concern I, I, I might have is with respect to the hours that, you know, we talked about the standard being open until 2. I think the applicant said, well, it would be later than 2. I do think this area feels a little bit more residential than where the standard is. And therefore, you know, I think the event that's going at 1.30 in the morning with music, um, and I don't know what the ordinances would allow or not allow, but that does concern me a little bit. Um, and maybe there could be some limitation with respect to how late those parties could go. And, and, the, and the board, of course, um, has the flexibility, especially because we're dealing with the D1 use variance, to impose whatever conditions uh, you all feel are, are, are reasonable under the circumstances. Yeah, my only comment would be I live in a neighborhood where people like to party and they do have late parties and they're pretty loud. So um, I guess the noise ordinance would apply to them as it could to any residential zone in town, correct? It does, um, though it's how many times and so forth throughout the place to come. Um, and there, and said the residential locations are incredibly close here, whether it's to the east or to the west. Seven yeah. feet is the closest. And, and noise always um, implies enforcement issues because by the time you call someone, party's over sometimes. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah. So. I don't remember, you do have to endure it until the ordinance takes effect. Yeah. That's the problem. So, at, you know, if it's 11 p.m., you do have to sit at 10.30 and listen. So, so there's something to... You know, it being a residential area and putting a commercial event space into a residential area, you do have to do we deal with everything that comes along with that, which speaks to the variance. I also find it interesting that there's nobody from any of the neighborhoods yeah. in attendance this evening. Well, I, I mean, I know that doesn't change our decision making necessarily. But. If I may add something on that, please. Um, can I have a motion to open the hearing to the public? Moved open. Second, public. All those in favor? Aye. Thank you. Uh, I, in fact, had to, uh, well, I elected to issue two types of notices on two different properties. So the, the, the list of property owners that received the notice was a lot greater than perhaps necessary, but I was very conservative in that I needed to, I wanted to also notice the neighbors around the parking lot being utilized. So not only did I do the subject building, I also did the subject parking lot. And no one has shown up in opposition. Which I think is a very relevant consideration. Um, keep in mind, and I applaud Mr. Sosolo, and I think he did it right in terms of how to notice for this application. That's something actually I mentioned to the chair right from the get-go, mm -hmm. um, so credit to him. Um, but keep in mind that I don't know if the notice talked about the the hours of operation or, or what they entailed. So just on the on the, the hours that should go, which is what you're talking about. With Casa Colombo and VFW Post, they're currently having events at whatever time. I assume they go until, until late at night on, on occasion. I mean, do we have any knowledge of noise issues? I mean, they, those are also close to residential, to residences. Do we have any knowledge of? We're not aware issues? of. We're not aware of what violations they have. No. 
this space currently has none of it. So you're going from zero to 100, basically. <laughs> If nothing else, I'll close the public portion of the meeting. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. I'll strike that. Yeah. Thank you for coming to the bank, please, and oh, identify sure. yourself. Sure. This be sworn, right? Um, yes. Anyway, just raise your right hand. Do you swear from testimony you're about to give in tonight's proceeding? Do you choose Paul Truth by Paul Truth? Yes. Your name, spelling your name, and your address. Sir. Roger, R O G E R, Bedner, B E D I N E R, 12 Meadow Lane, Roseland, New Jersey. Go ahead. I'm one of the owners and also the realtor that's currently uh, uh, putting this property for, for for lease for sale. What we uh, you are the owners of the property. I'm sorry. You are the owners. Yes. Of the property. One, yeah. The uh, the one thing that uh, nobody has mentioned here is that uh, being in Millburn, you have trade service. So maybe uh, not everybody needs to park their car or even take a car. They could just walk over to the train. It gets in very close proximity to that. Uh, we also try to. Um, build a multifamily here. Uh, we were denied by the town as well as the DEP because of reasons that uh, Mr. Keller had mentioned. So we've tried every which way to have some space here and just, you know, this, we, we all feel we went with these people because we thought that they have a very good model, business plan, and I uh, think they really want to make the business work and make this uh, not an eyesore for the town anymore. Why'd you let it get to be an eyesore? We did not. We purchased the property about a year ago, year and a half ago. And made an offer to fix it up. We did. That's what I did. Yeah. Uh, we tried to put a multifamily there, but we were not able to do that. But well, the current building, nothing's been done with. I'm sorry? The current building, nothing's been done with. No, we've maintained it, um, you know, but we couldn't do anything until we knew what, what we were going to do with it. So we needed to have an approval in order to do anything. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Then I'll close the public portion again. So we'll break this into two votes. Yes. Well, I think that um, you can just actually take one vote because it's a D1 use variance and the um, bulk variances and the waivers are subsumed into, into the use variance. So and, and, and certainly, um, even if there are no conditions um, that are attached to anyone's motion to approve, I would recommend that one of the conditions would be that the parking lot agreement would be maintained at all times. Mm -hmm. So that if, if for some reason that uh, Dr. Crosser sells his property or revokes the license, that automatically um, that would be a, con a condition of proof that would be violated and they would have to come back you know, before the board uh, to offer alternative arrangements. Because that's what's been proposed to justify, and certainly in, in large part, to justify the variance relief. And one last thing, sort of to go along with what Rob said, that the, the hours of the operation have been delineated to be outside of the parking grid. So, that is the concern as if you do not have spaces outside those very limiting hours, it becomes the burden of the township. So um, right now it's you know to put a restriction that it can only operate at the times of the parking is incredibly limited. But what do you do outside of that? And who's gonna enforce this? That's the other thing. So, Not you. Right. <laughs> so, the, so the, all these things are great, but right. So, so the agreement says sixteen parking spaces, uh, seven days a week, solely for its business and patron parking during during the term of the agreement. Monday three to closing, two Tuesday eight p.m. to closing, Wednesday eleven a.m. to closing, Thursday eight p.m. to closing, Friday three p.m. to closing, Saturday twelve p.m. to closing, and Sunday eleven a.m. to closing. That's what it states in the agreement. And must vacate the lot two inches of snow after 9 p.m. Mm -hmm. So like I said, it's very limited. Do I have a motion? Do I have a motion? 
motion? Yes, we do one motion. Okay, so I move to approve application uh, calendar number 3909-22. So a second. One second. Is there any conditions associated with that approval? Yes, the one you mentioned. Yes, okay, the one you said. The condition is the <laughs> adherence um, to the parking lot agreement, right? And should, and, and should the parking lot agreement be revised or rescinded or modified that the applicant has to return to the board? Yes. Can we also put a condition on what the time of closing is? You yeah, absolutely sure. Does anyone have any ideas? I've been sitting here thinking about that question. I hate to pose more limitations on an already somewhat limited business. On the other hand, it seems like by like 12, 1 o'clock, if we're still partying, plus 1 o'clock. I don't know. It seems like. A I would lot. go with the Norse Ordinance. You would go what? The Norse Ordinance, which is 11 p.m. Is it 11? Is it 11 p.m.? But it's a, so I guess the question is what's the noise, right? So if there's no, if there's no music, why would they need to stop? Certainly, music should stop. And there's a noise ordinance already in place. Noise ordinance already in place, I guess. Have so we're in the house, house with a noise ordinance violation. Yeah. How many times I've tried the neighbor you, behind me? You can attach it to decibels if you want to. Well, if you want to get specific, the cops show decibels. up, but they can't do it. Right. They come back for the four more times. Say, we're here to tell you that you're violating the noise right. ordinance, but we can't do anything about it. So. So any condition regarding noise? This is the slippery slope. Can we? Right. So we have a motion on the table in a second. Do we have a second? So, so, so one of the, can I chime in? Mm -hmm. That what the board may want to continue, uh, may want to uh, think about as a condition of approval regarding time and, and noise <laughs> is you may want to um, think about allowing the events to last longer on the weekends and shorter during the week. Um, that's the way that boards have done it in the past. Um, the weekend would include Friday, Saturday, Sunday? Friday, Saturday, typically. A non-school night. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really sure how to do that or enforce that. Yeah. I mean, you can put it in there, but uh, I mean, it's arbitrary. The time's arbitrary at best. I mean, I think once you uh, do the keys to the castle, you can. I think we're in the position of simply giving the applicant the opportunity to do something here. And we're being rather flexible and rather open about it. We're looking for the opportunity to do something with this. You know the whole. It's the is the benefit outweighing the detriment aspect. It's that this is an eyesore for decades, and we're giving someone the chance to take their own risk. But just keep in just to keep in mind something. It's the standard here is not the, do the benefits outweigh the detriments, yeah. right? That that is for a C two flexible C two variance. Mm -hmm. The standard here is is this property particularly suited given where it is, et cetera, for the proposed use. Right. Right? So and and then and then you have the positive criteria and then you have the negative criteria, mm -hmm. including the enhanced quality of proof as I as I described to you. Mm -hmm. Deferred maintenance is not a standard. Yeah. But the fact that they that the building go to shambles, that's not, that's the town's problem. That's not ours to cure. Yeah, that's, true. that's true. So I mean, you know, deferred maintenance and urban blight is not something that we're here to, to sort out. So the, sorry. No, so say so. So there's a motion of second conditioned on the um, agreement for parking remaining in effect. Any other conditions? Maybe. Um, so, so you, <laughs> so you said right that noise ordinance is difficult to enforce, but we could enforce our right. That's more enforceable than a business is open, you know, till eleven when the when the or is that not? We enforced? can say whatever we want, but are you going there at 11 to make sure it's closed? We don't have an enforcement on it. That's, that's why 
we can put whatever we want in there. But, but, but the zoning officer would. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, no. But, but the point being is that I'm not talking about this use. I'm talking about any use. Mm -hmm. If a supermarket it has to close at midnight and it's open at 1 o'clock in the morning and neighbors start complaining because they see mm -hmm. activity at 12.30, quarter to 1 in the morning, mm -hmm. they eventually will... Um, Find the businesses. Right, well, well, they'll talk to the zoning officer. The zoning officer may issue a warning, and, and that's you know how it goes. It may end up in municipal yes, court we'll mm -hmm. on, on a violation. You know, people can't just say, okay, well, there's conditions here, and I'm not going to follow them. Mm -hmm. There'll be consequences if you choose to impose conditions or you don't have to. Well, I think that I'm not supportive of the application based on I don't think the criteria has been met. Mm -hmm. So for those who are, if you'd like to propose a a time, do so. I just need a little clarification. You actually went through the whole thing of what happens if someone's not obeying an ordinance mm -hmm. that's on the books. That there would be warnings. They could well, well, I, I was talking about a condition. Okay. Right. All right. But if we didn't condition. have condition and the noise ordinance is already established, it's 11 p.m. Mm -hmm. and the noise has to go down to a whatever level that is not considered uh, bothersome to the neighbors, then by that same thought process that if the neighbors did call a number of times saying that this property was not obeying the noise ordinance, then wouldn't they be subject to the same court appearance and fines that we just discussed with regard to the supermarket? Example? Yes, but, but I'll give you two two responses. Number one, this has nothing to do really with this application, just generally. Number one is that noise ordinances have to do with decibel levels, and it's only, frankly, it's enforceable if it has been blessed by the, by the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. I don't know if the Milburn Ordinance has been so blessed and approved. Number, one. number two is there's, in terms of hours of operation and restricting them as conditions of approval for any type of application, it's not necessarily to make sure that, that the applicant or the operator does not exceed a certain decibel level. So for example, if you're in a residential neighborhood and you know, do you want people uh, parking and loading and, and hitting their fobs and talking in the parking lot, you know, next to a single family residential home at 1.30 in the morning? Even if they're not violating a noise ordinance, and in fact, human voice is not regulated for purposes of the noise ordinance. So that's something for this board to determine if you care about that or not care about that. You're introducing a new factor into the environment that it doesn't correctly exist mm -hmm. from the condition of the building. Party ends at midnight and everyone ends on the street and starts talking and hanging out for another hour. There's nothing enforceable. You can't enforce that. I would throw out potentially that during the week, like on a school night, that the, the, the business should not be open past 11, which is the ordinance booker. But on a Friday or Saturday night, it could be extended later till midnight or 1 a.m., something like that. If others, I don't know how others feel. I don't even know if that's the exact right times, but something like that. 12 or 1. I'm still on the fence. I just, I hate yeah. limiting a business. I would say 12. I think one is late. Yeah. I agree, 12. Yeah. Another point of question, could the applicant come back and say, in, in the future, and say we'd like to have this go to the one, there's been no problems, I don't know if that's open to them in the future, on the weekends, something like that. Just um, a question. Let me just get one second. So Regina, absolutely. So an applicant can certainly, and it happens actually more frequently than you think, where they are given a set of conditions, you know, many times way more than two. And they'll come back in after a couple of years and they'll say, hey, look, you know, we have these 22 conditions or even 12 conditions, and we'd like to modify certain of the conditions. We've, you know, we've had no problems with our neighbors. And in fact, here are five of our neighbors that are here supporting us with our modified condition. So the applicant can always come back to the board and ask for modification of, of conditions. So that's, that's my proposal, 11 on a school night, and 12 on the weekend. So it would be to midnight Friday and Saturday nights and 11 p.m. all other nights, because they're gonna be open for seven days. Yes. That's the motion of the second. 
Okay. Yes. Any any other any other conditions? Are we? Yes. Amy Lawrence? Yes. Wolf Pine Tutorials? Yes. Gary Rosen? Yes. Virginia Truitt? Yes. Jessica Black? No. Craig Putnam? No. Good luck with the passes for five affirmative votes. Next up, we have the matter card of January 9th. That is uh, calendar 3903.22, two wit copies. For me? <laughs> this is a continuation. Continuation. Was everybody here before? Yes. Like, can everybody vote? Okay. Okay. Um, well, actually, yeah, that is, is, yeah. Yeah, Regina was on the phone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah Regina was here. Yeah, right there. Mm -hmm. We're always looking for another alternate, so, yeah, it's good suggestions. <laughs> yeah. The, um, I sent a letter on January 24th. Everybody should have it, I think. Okay, and a full size set of prints, not a half scale like I brought at the last meeting. Mm -hmm. So, so Tim, why don't you identify? If we're not going to mark it because you sent them in to everyone, but just identify the date and what the plans consist of as revised. The plans for us now are 21, 22, 23, 24. The first ones were, you know, single digits, and we went to the 11 digits. So now we're in the 20 digits, and these plans are dated um, 125. 23. And the sheets are what numbers? So oh, awkward. Well, you made a stand over here. Yeah, 20, you, can, you can. 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. 21, 22, it's, it's 21 through. Um, 26. Yes, 21 through 26. All dated uh, 125, 23. And then I have an exhibit that I created. For the benefit of the board. 
Okay, can I commence? Yep, you're privileged to be sworn, and uh, your credentials are accepted by the board. So Thank you. Continue. So on my letter of January 24th, I'd like everybody to just pull it out if they can. Um, and we went back, we looked at everything again, we tried to figure out what to do. We spoke a little bit with the neighbor, and um, I spoke again with the neighbor tonight when I got here, and uh, not to speak for the neighbor, but I'm going to say that she's on board with the application at this point. <clears throat> um, and what we did, which I noted right here, is we increased the side yard setbacks 18 foot high to 7.8 feet. Increase the side yard above to set 7.8. I'll show it to you all again. You know, we eliminated the FAR variance, and that I had actually previously showed you. And uh, I lowered the ridge about three feet on the building to kind of scale it down. And um, in addition to that, I kind of gave you the corrected uh, denial letter. And I'm going to just take you to the attachment E form as I kind of walk you through what we did. Uh, I rotated the surveys and I only did that because I wanted to get the surveys to be orientated the same way as the plans themselves. <laughs> so this is that 7.8 right there. I also added 10 six foot tall conifers, uh, green giants on that to buffer that area. And, Thank you. Yeah, you guys have this as your last page. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see where I added um, in green. Uh, that was something that uh, I'm not even sure the neighbor realizes that we did. But I, I just thought after looking at the site again, it probably it made sense to get a little green buffer into there. And then I want the board to realize that this existing deck is really... I don't know. It's about three feet off of the property line. This existing deck that we're removing is part of the application. We're also removing the existing garage that's there as part of this application. Because when I come into my new proposed plan on the right here, you can see where we've actually removed the garage. I added the neighbor's house in and I added the neighbor's deck in. So you could get an idea that really that's the view that we were talking about last time. It's actually kind of a little bit improved because I got rid of the garage in this case. And I have an aerial photo, I think, that will show it to you better. And we could pull everything into this 7.8 feet off the property line and leave the street side on Winningham, uh, you know, at that 13.1. I go now, my basement level, all I did was pull everything in again and tighten it up and I pushed it over so that I could get further away. It's funny, but you see those two little posts there? They are, I guess, they are the posts from the old deck that we removed that, you know, the posts are still sitting there. We, they're dotted for us because we're removing. They're not actually still there. But um, would you want to come up so you can see better? Or then the um, I'm now back on my first floor. Right, we just tightened everything up. You can see the outline of the existing building and the outline of the existing deck. It's it's three point eight three feet off the property line. And we've gotten rid of that. Here's the existing neighbor's house. It's 10.2 feet off. There's that neighbor's deck. And that is actually the garage that we're removing, which is a pretty big area. I mean, the garage is really about the area of our addition in terms of footprint. And I come up to my second floor, and then we have that small habitable attic area that we had before. I come to my front elevation. You know, none of this work is really apparent at all. Come to the rear elevation. That's where we've dropped the whole building down um, about three feet. And I had to make the second floor actually a little smaller to pull that off. But that's what we did. Um, I'd like to mark on this. 
Is that okay? <laughs> I, I don't need to work on it. Let me. I, I, I don't need to work on it. What's that? Oh, yeah, it did. It took the aluminum. It's almost like a sin or something. Yeah. So then you can see the small area of um, violation. I tried to get it to eight feet, but I just was having a lot of trouble fitting the garage. That's really what happened. And I didn't want to push this way into the streetscape. So we have that point two tenths, no, point two feet. It's about three inches that we're violating for that little corner. Then when I hit above the 18, that is the violation line. So that area is the area that's in violation for that second side yard setback. And if I go back to attachment E, I'm talking about the second one of those two. So, so, so why is it, why is one 0 0.2 feet extended variance and the next one is 2.85 feet? Uh, because it's, it's actually, you could say we actually put it here. It's 2.85 at the worst condition, right there, it's 2.85 when we penetrate the roof here. So that distance, that violation is 2.85 in that triangular area. That's above 18 feet. Below, down here, it's really 0.2 feet. Because required is 8 feet and we're at um, 7.8. So the worst condition is the 2.85. Okay, but you're not at 7.8 at the worst condition. That's, 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 um... I'm just trying to get it straight. If I no, we actually it. are at 7.8. Well, at the worst condition, this is... I'm not... 10.65 is where we actually are. Okay. 10.65, I can see it right sense. here. 10.65 minus 2.85 is 8. I pray is somewhere close to 7.8. Right. It should be, you know. I can, uh, I'm not going to, you can see the triangle. I got it. Thank you. Triangle up there. Okay. Then if I keep going. <clears throat> Then I'm on um, really what I would call the most important elevation we got, really, the Winningham side. So we kept our primary building. We changed our siding material at what we call this little link. You notice I torqued it a little bit off of the property line. And then we built our new building, um, which is now a really almost like an expanded cape the way we did it. Before it was a Dutch. Now it's actually. I'm going to say why I say an expanded cape. Sort of a caped roof, but expanded left and right. right? Dormered left and right. Really, really expanded cape. And the only reason why this roof is here is because it scales the building. Right? If you could remove that roof and you'd have a sort of like a two-story colonial, but it look a little boring. This roof is what pulls the building down to try to minimize its scale. So, so those three windows, boom, 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 those are? Way back. Way back. Uh, back at the main building. Way at the... Um, do they have existing windows on the third floor? Of the third floor. They're up here on the third floor. Mm -hmm. There. Then I'm going to go, I'm going to just take you to this, which I'll call A1, and yes. I'll leave with you when I leave tonight. The uh, This is my A1, and um, I, I guess the most important thing I wanted to say about this is, as I really looked at this site, and I don't know if anybody got back out there, but I went out and I staked it, and I put the yellow... Um, like a little caution tape around to kind of demark the addition. And uh, if I look at the Whittingham Street, and then this road is actually cocked back. 
So when you start to look at this, this house is like way back in terms of where these two houses are. Uh, the, um, the deck for this house is actually back a little bit further than our addition. When you look at it, but it, a lot of that is being generated just because the street is kind of pushing in and we're creating a lot of we're sort of losing depth because we're not at a 90 degree angle. And in some ways our addition helps helps this little problem because if you start to really go up here, it looks almost as if these houses are kind of crawling back on you and our building itself sitting in this area will stop to act to foreshorten that whole look. If I, you can kind of see it here in this photo that I called photo B because I am straight on. So if I'm straight on to Whittingham, is that the right one? Whittingham? It's Whittingham. Whittingham. If I'm straight on to Whittingham, you can see how the other buildings are stacked in relationship to it. And that stacking is occurring this way. Our build, our addition is actually only out of this deck point here. This white is that building up the road, not this one. The red brick is this building. Everything is really stacked here. And our our, build, our, our um, addition will start, start to actually close these backyards a little better. You can see the whole thing occurring again here where our site, the neighbor's site, with the deck, and then the brick building, the third site. And then the same, I just wanted you to get a look at these photos. There's that existing deck that we're removing as part of this. Um, that's everything I have, yeah. We have that, we have a the building height issue here, I mean, of a foot, because we're making our building height go further. I was just trying to, compare the height of the building to the ridge line, but how does that? We didn't lower the ridge line. It says line of previously submitted ridge line. Yeah, yeah, let me, let me get. I'm just get looking it. at the difference in. I had the other drawing. See, we were up there. My ridge was up at that heavy dotted line before. And that's that three feet where I'm saying that we lowered the line. But we changed it from a gamble to uh How does that tie in with what's there? It just looks like it's just We tied we just pushed them right together. No, 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 it'll work out fine because what we did is we, um, and that's why we originally had it as a gambrel. But what we did was uh, the Shutian plan. We, we treated, well, maybe it may be easier up on the Shutian plan. Well, I, I don't want to draw on the drawing, but we we turned that into a box. And you can really see it if you look through here. We created this as a box. And we made that box the expanded cape. And then we had our existing building, which was here. And this area right there is this triangle that we changed the material on the front. So that we could kind of um, could kind of juxtapose the two. So we had our existing building, our proposed building, and we kind of stopped them like that and formed a link between. And that link between is really vertical side, board and batten in this case, because it just the board and batten will look um, more traditional than if it was vertical side. If you were doing the same thing in a contemporary, you would be like Cypress, you know, four inch vertical siding. And now it, it, um, it drove my guys wild drawing it because my guys hate to draw at an angle to begin with. What did that accomplish? Was that, did that accomplish the increase in the MR? 
No, what it did, it, it's, it let us separate the two boxes so I didn't feel like I had to align the ridges. Because I thought before when I had a, a gambrel roof in the front, I wanted a gambrel roof in the back that was kind of teed into it. Right? And so they come into each other perpendicular. So they would all mesh together. But then when I wanted to lower it, I kind of just changed the roof. Like this will look more like there wasn't, probably no one would notice it, except some kids in a third year architectural class maybe or something. But it'll look like really the existing box and a link and then the proposed building. The historic commission would love this because um, who was it? That was, who was on the historic commission? Because it's that thing where we kind of <laughs> isolate. <laughs> we isolate the 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 nineteen twenty structure and twenty twenty three structure, and we show the articulation. But we haven't really done that because we don't want to. Uh, that position can sometimes look kind of awkward over mm -hmm. time. You know, this isn't the right house for that. This is a little house in Melbourne. It's not a, you know, something that you're trying to put on in progressive architecture or something. But you, but you know what, from the historic commission, the idea of bifurcating these buildings. So that, it, what it allowed me to do is it allowed me to lower the building, which the more and more I looked at driving up Whittingham, that's the important thing is to get this building low so that it doesn't look like it's coming on you because you're actually driving uphill. And that's... Um, and the one, that's, the yeah. one foot overage for the building height is just that one small section yeah. that you were showing us? What we did, what creates that is... Um, just to see. The... Existing grade is lower as you're coming up towards town. So as we expand our building into the lower area, our building is actually more out of grade. So our mean grade actually has dropped. You know, from the front, this building, you know, looks relatively small. But then as it goes back, the grade drops, and you can see it, we've actually tagged it. Our mean grade existing and our mean grade proposed is really about a foot and a half lower. And it's a product of the existing. We are manipulating that too, because you can see the existing grade line. And then this area, everything between the dark line and the dotted is where we filled so that the building looks better from the street, but um, it doesn't help me in calculations because I have to calculate the existing. Easily. The existing house has gotten the average grade has gotten lower because the building got longer is all that's um we kind of have we I know that we fixed it by filling this side that would be the best best way I would really will continue to fill a little bit because the driveway still has distance before you turn in so if we bring the dirt we lower the um we lower the look of the grid. There's a great building that does this actually. If you're driving into Chatham on 24 and you see where that um, that Serenade restaurant is on the right, and you keep going a little bit, there's a brick building on the left. And when you look at it, now you'll see that it's actually burned up in front and there's parking in the lower level. It's not a new building, it's been around a long time, but it. You can see how the manipulation of the grade helps to visually lower the mass of the building. I don't know why they did it there, but it's been there 
you know, I don't know, 30 years or something. It's not a new building. But if you drive it up that way, you should see it because it worked really well in that building. But that's. Um, I got a question for you, Plessy. Just a general question. What would be the hardship if you did it, if you stayed within the code? But this is a site that's probably impossible to actually conform to code because it's got the corner lot problems, but it's also just a small site. Like if I was 40 feet off of this Whittingham, the entire building, this the site is unbuildable. If I was 40 feet here, I don't even have a buildable area. Then I would need eight feet here. There's no, this is a bad site. It has no real, it's a terrible site. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. It's, um, it really doesn't have a buildable area. It's got a detached garage in a front yard, right? It doesn't, I guess that garage would need to be 80 feet, I guess. No. Or now, a garage. Yeah. But you know, we can't. The garage is, the existing garage is eight and a half feet off the property line, right? The building, at least the building is 13.1. You know, we've been able to maintain it. It doesn't look that bad because remember it's 13.1, but then there's another 12 feet to the curb. So it doesn't look as bad as it sounds when I say it, but this is a, uh, and the, the garage has that little folded plate roof. Did you see that? That's like that double peak roof. You know, that's, I'd say not not a good look, I would say, but you know, right? I, I mean, I think we, you know, making kind of dramatic improvements to the site. So it's like a cleanup job, it's, but it's not a, uh, I wouldn't recommend that you bought the site if it comes on the market, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> I know, I know, he's my client. I know. And he came, he, he flew all the way up from yeah. uh, Chile for this tonight and has to fly back tomorrow for, for this meeting. Okay, great. Uh, any questions for Mr. Plessy? Any questions from the audience? Is that a yes? Sure. No, okay. Just questions. Just, just identify who you are. Oh, um, um, first name J I E Y U, last name C H U. Uh, good evening, evening everybody. Sp spell your last name again. I'm sorry. Oh, oh name Six Sweet Cup, please. No, no, no. And your last name is Sue. You said C H U. C H U. Yeah, C H U. And where? I'm sorry. What your address is? Where? Six Sweet Cup, please. Thank you. Would, yeah. Uh. If, uh, uh, the, uh, so sorry, my English is <laughs> not good, so I so will far, speak so. slowly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, if the addition is completely according to this drawing, this new desire, I will agree. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's all. Okay, okay. so Thank state you. point of question, but take that. Uh, any statements from the audience that haven't already been made? Okay. Pretty much. Yeah. But, sorry. Yeah. She answered as a question. Yeah, we, that happens yeah. very often. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, anything else for Mr. Plessing before I close the public portion? Then I place out, close the public portion of this meeting. Board members, what say you? So this is a tough lot, there's no question about that. And I think the, the modifications that have been made have definitely lowered the masking. Masking was the thing that concerned me the most, uh, especially when driving towards town on Woodcock. Um, that was definitely uh, my concern. I think this definitely has lowered the uh, lowered building height and made the, made the addition a lot less assuming on the street. So I would support the application. I think also that it consolidates everything into one building and eliminates the detached garage, 
which isn't exactly a beautiful structure as it sits right now. I think it's a, a marked improvement. I, I would support this. Any other comment? Goodness, uh, just to echo what you said when I looked at the property, it's pretty obvious that having that uh, that ugly garage there uh, to take that down is, is an improvement. And you've taken some good measures to make the neighbor happy, and I'm happy to hear that the neighbor is happy. Uh, and, uh, yeah, thanks. I'd say that's remarkable, but let's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> full that into um, Anyway, can I have a motion in this case? I move approval of calendar number 3903-22. Great, and second. Second, thank you. Ashley Abigdor? Yes. David Lawrence? Yes. Gary Rosen? Yes. Wolfgang Yes. 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 Good luck with the project. Yeah. Thank safe, you. Safe flight Thanks. back. Eight hours. Um, but let the record show there's no one else in the audience tonight uh, in regards to any other matters not on the agenda. Can I have a motion to adjourn? And a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Happy to be here. Thank you.